Just like your picture. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going for. <laughs> oh, I like your background. Thank you. That's your studio, is it? Yes. It's my home studio. I mean, I say that as if I have another one. It's my own, it's my only studio. <laughs> I know. Yes. Well, what, I was very impressed when you said it. So you could have left it there and I would have thought, oh, well, I probably would have asked you actually. I probably would have said, oh, do you have another one? <laughs> do you have a yeah. bigger one? Yeah. This is it's very brand new to me. So, I mean, I haven't even really fully moved into it quite yet. Yeah. Okay. We are good. Yeah. Still, still recording. <laughs> I never trust the technology. You know what? Mainly, mainly oh, because it's always it blows up on me oh, quite regularly. Uh, okay, me so too. now what's if that you're... word for when you're for when you're what? When you're afraid of technology, you know that word. There's a word Techni like technophobic a, it... or a no, there's another word. Yeah, that one. Yeah, I'm a That's... bit borderline. Well, um, being a luddite isn't being afraid of it. It's where you hate it. Like the luddites <laughs> came That's from. That's the one um, I have. <laughs> from i think it was in the industrial revolution they they sort of were rebelling against the the industrial level revolution Gee, i'm making up words here and everything now and uh, they would break into mills you know like wool mills or steel mills and they'd smash them they'd smash the machines um and then they were they, they called themselves the luddites i don't know where it came from it sounds german doesn't it yeah, I, I mean, I kind of, uh, I, I, I kind of relate. I don't know if I would have broken into any mills to break stuff, but you know, that's where sameness, right? All of a sudden, we like mass production. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what, but that's what they were rebelling. Then I would be on board. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, you can break your own stuff if you want. No one's going to mind if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, right now, if you're listening, I'm talking to Juliet Belmonte in. Uh, Florida. Now, did I pronounce your name right? You did. Yeah. Juliet Belmonte. Yep. Belmonte. Good. My first name is actually Eileen, though. Yeah. So. Oh. I go by my middle name, Juliet. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. That's like your stage name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, not at all. No, it's my. I've been, <laughs> I've been Juliet my whole life, or Julie, but. Um, I'm like the 14th Eileen in my family. So I was always, uh, I've always gone oh, by my. Oh, all right. I understand. Like you, everybody calls yeah. you yeah. Juliet. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. But your yes, actual yes. name is. I didn't know is... my name was Eileen until I went to school, actually. True story. So uh, my teacher had to tell me my name was Eileen. I had no idea. It's totally alien to me. I've never really gone by Eileen ever in my life. All right. But I had to, you know, I felt like I had to say that Juliet isn't my actual, real, true first name Silene Juliet Belmonte yeah okay um that's that's Eileen is quite an Irish name and Belmonte sounds either sounds French and Juliet sounds well, my mom, it Italian <laughs> well my mom is French and my father is from Argentina but he was uh, originally from Spain so so my mom, the Juliet part is French, and my father is of uh, Spanish descent. Right. And where did the Eileen come from? I think my mom had a great, great grandmother that was French Canadian. So, you know, okay. I'm kind of a mutt like most people. So, yeah. Um, uh, the, the French Canadian half Irish. I know her name was McCormick. So oh, she was yeah. definitely Irish. And my mom really... Um, liked her or for their or at least likes likes the stories about her um yeah so there was a there is some irish in me somewhere okay. i mean my mom's a redhead so that's a french a redhead <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a giveaway named eileen yeah eileen yeah. mccormick yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, now, just to give you time context for our conversation, today is Wednesday, the 8th of February, 2023. Um, so for someone listening who hasn't seen your work, how would you describe your paintings? Um, well, they are portraits, um, mostly women, although I do occasionally paint men. And they are, um, I paint in a lot of layers and they are um, very 
captured and I try to, uh, I guess, tell a story um, in, in the portrait, in the expression, in the face. Um, so that's, uh, I try to make there, well, I don't try to make them very emotional, but I think, I think I put a lot of emotion into them. Um, and, uh, and yes, they are, they are layered, rich, storied portraits with a lot of color. Yeah. Um, a lot of layers, metaphorically, I try to put layers in it. And then I also technically use a ton of layers. Right. Yes. And um, I would just add to that, if you're listening, that when you look at them, they are beautiful and rich and, and uh, textural. But then when you look closely at them, you realize that they're actually, the textures are made up of um, mixed media. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, that's a big thing. Yeah. 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 I guess I should have said that. Yes. I use a lot of collage, although I do paint a, a lot of, a, you know, a lot of people ask me if it's painted or collage. And the answer is that I would say it's 50, 50. So a lot of times, like if I use, um, for instance, lace, which I like to use, I like to find old pieces of lace and use that. Um, I will use the actual lace, but then I will paint what the lace looks like elsewhere. Um, to sort of have two different looks and feels of the same fabric. So I will use the actual fabric and then I replicate the fabric by painting it, if that makes sense. It does. Which is kind it of does. just fun. It's kind of fun to do. But I also just like introducing it um, like a theme in a different way. Yeah. It's, it's, it's challenging in a fun way, but I also think visually it's kind of interesting. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not um, all collage, although, yes, of course, I should have mentioned that. That is a huge part of my portrait. <laughs> I, I incorporate a lot of different materials into my paintings, almost shamelessly, truly. I will incorporate almost anything into my paintings as far as materials. And good. another, I think, distinct thing that I should mention um, is that I start with acrylics and I finish with oils. So, and I know a lot of people don't do that, but that is how I do. So I do all the mixed media part of my painting, which is about, I don't know if, if I'm going to use percentages, I would say it's about 70% of an acrylic. And then once I'm, you know, happy with my composition and I know exactly what I'm going to do, then I move on to the oils portion. So I don't do any of the gluing or, or, you know, adhesives or any of that with oil. Um, I do all of that in the acrylic phase. Yeah. So yeah, I guess that's another thing that um, makes my 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 paintings a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Now, just to put your sensibilities in context, who are your creative heroes? Are they all painters, or does it spread out from into other disciplines? Well, I know my mom would want me to say that it was my mother. Um, <laughs> I did. <laughs> Okay, get that out I of the way. I did grow up. <laughs> she actually <laughs> told me to say that once um, when I was much younger. But I mean, I in a way she was because um, she was a nurse by profession um, for most of her life. She was an RN director, and then um, but she always painted. And then at some point uh, when we were growing up, she started painting more than she started doing her other job um, and was able to make a living at it. And I spent a tremendous amount of time um, in her studio. And um, she had like, she had kind of a fun approach um, to painting and kind of casual um, approach to it. But she also took it really seriously. And I think that I, you know, I was lucky uh, one that I grew up thinking it was possible to make a living as an artist because I don't you know and I just took for granted I never and I, I I know I realize now how lucky I was to have that influence um but also she had a lot of fun in there she would listen to like crazy music and you know kind of play around and she wasn't afraid to try different things she didn't take herself you know too seriously as an artist but then she you know was serious about um improving and learning new things every day and um, so I think I got that from her. 
Um, so I, I got that out of the way, but it's also true, you know, obviously that's a huge influence, right? I grew up with, with her and, and seeing that every day of my life. So, um, uh, as far as my creative heroes outside of her, you know, it changes every day. Really. It really does. I like people that work, that go in the studio and work every day. Like that's, that's something I really value. Um, and that don't become like complacent in their practice, you know, like, oh, now I know everything, you know, now. <laughs> um, it changes every day. I mean, now we have Instagram. There's people that are so vastly different um, than how I paint that um, that I really, I just, I, I think are really exciting painters and they have nothing to do with, with how I paint. And there are people that I just discover on Instagram every day. Um, as far as you know, historical people, I think a lot of people compare my, well, not compare, but I, I would say that some people see Klimt in my work. Um, and uh, he's definitely a creative hero. Um, Sheil, I like very, very much. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different people. When I, when I was younger, I really was influenced by um, Edward Hopper and his use of light. And um, they just change constantly. I, I, I really like to say Ga, um, you know, all the, all the, all the masters and then, and then not, not all the masters, but I, 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 I just went through so many different phases and through so many different styles um, myself and, and it continues to evolve. And I am just influenced every day by different people that I, that I see different museums that I go to and, I'm not really, I don't get caught up on like trying to be influenced by one um, person or movement or anything like that. Right. How did you, you were speaking about your mom and watching her um, painting. How, mm -hmm. how did you get from there, being a kid, seeing this to being an artist? What was your journey like? Yeah, so I, um, like I said, I, I was very lucky. I have always, always drawn and uh, painted, um, and mostly because of my mom. But also, I was a, um, I was an extremely shy child um, and weird. And I also didn't speak English. I moved here from Costa Rica um, when I was about seven. And my parents decided it was a really good idea to move us to Northern Maine. And, you know, you probably don't have a lot of concept of that being from Ireland, but it is uh, not exactly culturally diverse to say the least. And, um, <laughs> you know, being a, a, a little Spanish kid in Northern Maine was a, a strange experience. And I was already very, very shy. And I, I really did draw as an escape. I draw and I read a ton and, um, didn't so make, being, hang on a sec. Stupid. You you said you were one of seven. Where were you in the seven? Mm -hmm. I'm number six. Six. Yeah. Okay. I'm number six. Yeah. yeah. And through to escape, I I just I did these. You know, I put my head down like a classical little weirdo on my desk, and I just tried to hide. And I did these, you know, elaborate pictures, um, which was great. Except that, of course, made me uh, not so great of a student. So I was not. <laughs> with the teacher, I was always spacing out. And I, it became such a problem that um, my mom, God bless her, to, to sort of help me. She was like, okay, if you like bring your grades up, you know, I'll take you to art classes. And she took me to this studio. It was like the Mr. Ducharme studio. It was like, you know, where a lot of like old people painted flowers and stuff. But, and I was like, you know, I was 11. At that time we were living in Rhode Island. So it was a little bit better. Um, and I started painting there under the direction of this guy, uh, Mr. Ducharme. And, you know, when you're little and somebody says like, oh, you know, you're, you're really good at this. And everyone's like, ah. Um, and I, I loved it. Sounds I like a it. kid's book. <laughs> Mr. Ducharme's in New York online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds yeah. great. It was, all, it was all old, like, it was all these old biddies, you know, it was, it was great. And they all fussed over me and. I was such a weird and awkward and shy kid that it, it was, you know, it felt great to be in that studio and to be good at something. And I knew I was pretty good at it for my age, you know, and I enjoyed it. And I did like, you know, like landscapes with, um, you know, with the classic kind of bird flying in between the mountains. And I was just like, wow, 
you know, but I mean, <laughs> I remember like painting a picture of our cat and just thinking like, wow, this is awesome. You know, his name was Egg Roll and, um, you know, it's hilarious <laughs> when I look at it now, because I remember the cat and the, and the painting was laying on someone's jeans. And I remember painting and the stitching in the jeans and thinking that like, that was really next level, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And then I signed it Julie, like really big at the bottom. So, yeah. Um, and then I, I just I had I, I just kept at it uh, my whole life. I really, truly have painted um, my whole life. I painted and um, and drawn um, as an escape. I always wanted to do it professionally. I I am you know I am really lucky that I'm able to do it because I'm not really. Um, I don't know. I don't think I'm really suited to do much else. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just, this suits me perfectly. I like to be alone. I like to be in my studio. I like to just sort of get lost in what I'm doing. I am not afraid of spending like all day long working on, uh, you know, an eye, you know, I, I work hard at what I do and it like, it suits my personality really well. I've had a million other jobs to be able to, to get to this point, but um, this is what, you know, this is what I always wanted to do to spend all day in my studio. Of course, now I have a three-year-old, so I don't really get to spend, you know, days on it in my studio the way I used to, but uh, <laughs> it's a work yeah. in progress I'm trying to figure out that talent still. So did you go from, um, Mr. Bouchard's or I can't remember his name. But did Ducharme. you go? Yeah. Ducharme. Did you go into, um, did you keep with the studying? Did like did you just did you go into art college or how, what about I went, that, that? I bit? went to school for graphic design. You know, although my mom was a painter, she still she was still of the mindset that um, that I should do something that's a little bit more practical. And maybe because she was a nurse, like to be able to support myself. And of course, graphic design at that time, everybody was going into it, and and I you know, it was sort of expected in my family that you would have to go to school. Um, and so this was the best bet for me to go to school for graphic design, um, which I had absolutely no interest in. I mean, I've already told you I didn't really like technology, so I'm not sure what I was doing in that field, but um, I did do that. Um, and I never, I never did it professionally. The minute I got out, I tried to find a way to make a living as a painter. And um <clears throat> You know, I was doing faux finishing and murals for a while because I was living in South Florida where that's, you know, it's pretty, I wouldn't say easy, but it's it's possible to, to make a lot uh, a, a living doing that kind of work. And at least it was painting. And I did learn, you know, a lot of really cool things. Um, and I worked on mega yachts, like trying to do, um, you know, believe it or not, when people have these mega yachts, they get like a ding in some piece of wood they have in there or some framing or something and then my job would be to go in there and try to replicate um try to fix that damage by way of painting to make it look exactly like its surroundings so sort of like faux finishing but a lot more uh technical um so that was another thing I did um and then uh I moved to Chicago and I started taking uh painting classes at the Art Institute of Chicago and that was the first time I really sort of um started taking painting more seriously uh and then i eventually moved to new york and that that was really um a huge shift for me because i started painting every single day at the art students league of new york um from the model which i just fell in love with and i went five days a week we would do a 40 hour um uh, 40 hour sessions with the live model. So um, long sits and I just became absolutely addicted to that. Um, so we would do a two week pose and I would, you know, we would paint from the same model. And then I became, yeah. Um, so that, and, and I, I, I did learn and work from different instructors at the Art Students League. Um, so I took, I took courses here and there throughout my life um, as a painter, but I, I don't have like a degree in, in, in painting per se. Um, right. I, it's just been like my own bits and pieces of picking, picking things up from instructors I like and, you know, my own practice and, you know, my good old mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Mr. Duchamp. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. 
Yes. All right. So we've had lots of questions come in on social media. This is the first of many. Um, Andrea Martinez on Instagram says, would you say you are in, more inspired by other artists or people in your life? Oh, I would say people, not necessarily people in my life, um, although that is a jump that I'm making. Um, and by that, I mean that I am switching to painting strictly people in my actual life at this moment, like my new you know, body of work is that's what it's going to be. But before that, you know, for a long time now, I've been painting um, pictures of um, mixtures of historical people, uh, not necessarily important historical people, and usually not um, just uh, photos that I find historical photos, and I mix them um, with different people in my life, but it's it's the historical photo that I'm inspired by. And there's usually something about it that I really like, um, whether it's like the pose or, or the earnestness or, you know, sometimes just the costume or, you know, these really wonderful photos of um, men before they were going off to war. And, you know, they would take that one important photo in their life. And I just love looking at those, you know, the tin types and thinking like, trying to imagine what that person may have been going through or thinking and and also what a big deal it was to take a photograph um and how now you know um there's there's not a lot of earnestness when people take photos right everybody's you know just a million selfies every single day that's just like oh my god i i like i like looking at these um at, at these photos and and thinking about how important they were what a big deal it was what it what an occasion that they were marking to have, to have had um their photos taken and then there's always something about that photo that i'll try to bring into my own painting but it's i, I don't copy i don't copy the photograph i i i find that very boring as a process but I also I feel like like for me it's um it's not very interesting looking to just take a photo and and copy it and so what I would do um to answer the question is I'm inspired by these people in these photographs that I don't know most of the time and then I will take people from my life and um mix them into the portrait for instance I paint my husband quite a bit um but the the stance he's in will have been from um a historical photo if that makes sense yeah um yeah so so i guess it's both you know i'm uh, you know I, i'm definitely more inspired by the people in my life but also just people yeah yeah, yeah. um um as far as you know other artists of course i'm inspired by other artists but i but i uh I try not to let it directly affect my paintings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I totally get what you mean about old photos. There's something about them, isn't there? There's just particularly the, you know, the very early when photography was very early and they had to stand very still and they still managed to make these amazing. I, I couldn't look that earnestly for that length of time. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how they did it, but it's amazing. And that whole thing yeah, of the, wonder, there's a story. I also wonder if that's why they look so serious sometimes, right? Like maybe they've been sitting there for 30 minutes trying to, you know, maintain this pose and this dignified look. You don't see people with big cheesy smiles from back in the day very much, do you? No, and like they used to have these, um, you, you probably know this, but you know that they used to have these... Um, they were like a tripod thing behind the person and it had a little kind of mm -hmm. U-shaped thing that used to they used to put into the back of their neck yeah. to keep them still. Can you imagine yeah. like <laughs> standing? Oh, this probably is why they weren't smiling because um, yeah. Yeah, it would be very exactly. hard to hold. It's probably, probably too hard to hold a smile. And if you didn't hold it, it would get blurred, I'd imagine. Um, you know, like yes. if you kept moving. But um, yeah. yeah. You couldn't waste that, right? You couldn't yeah. waste that photo. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, it's not like they go, oh, look, we'll do another one. Because they, back then they were on the glass and they had all the chemicals on it. And it like it was a big mm -hmm. deal if you wasted it. 
Do you get this thing yeah. when you're looking at the old photos of going, this it always happens to me. It's like I'm looking at the person, let's say it's a young man or a young woman, and I'm like, oh, yeah, right. And I'm sort of, well, I'm looking at a picture of an, oh, a young man or a young woman. So I'm thinking they're a young man or a young woman. And it always happens that somewhere this little voice will come into my head like, they're probably dead now. <laughs> you know, like they've, <laughs> yeah. they've lived, they they're got like, old, and they're, you know, yeah. they're not like, they're not that anymore. You have that yeah. too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, That's... it's kind of interesting. I've, I've been painting almost exclusively of dead people. So for, for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes, you know, because I'm, I'll be really truly gazing into their eyes trying to figure it out, you know, because there are aspects of that photo that I always bring into my own. Like I said, I will mix the features with the features of my husband or something, and you know, mm. looking into their eyes. And then I always sometimes like, oh, my God, this person's dead. You know, maybe their ghost will haunt me in my studio. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the sort of thing you can trot out at dinner parties, you know, I paint dead people. <laughs> well i'm changing that now thank you know now i'm i'm trying to go back to the living and um back to, to to real people real people in my life right now right now my favorite muse is my niece my niece my she's at uh, 16 years old and it's wonderful because i'll give her a concept and of course a 16 year old loves to take 5,000 photos of themselves so i'll just say like okay do you know certain series of of these and she sends me she sends me all these wonderful photos that I can choose from. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty great to have 16 year old uh, muse right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, and I love her, of course. Like I really only like to paint people that I really like. That's the truth. Ah, oh, lovely. Yeah. Um, so how does the idea for a painting start for you are you a sketchbook person do you write things down is it concept first like i want to make a painting about sorrow or is it i see a visual kind of beginning you know and you know how do you capture your little wispy bits of in inspiration um well i do have sketchbooks and i do write um but i do all of that sporadically I've always wanted to be one of those artists that always has a sketchbook and you know I I, I try every once in a while I try to be one of those artists because I'm a little bit jealous of those artists that sit in coffee shops and sketch people um, I think everyone is I think everyone is I don't think it's you just think like... everyone's jealous of those people I actually yeah. tried to do it once and I felt like a fraud I was like everyone's gonna know this isn't really my thing you know yeah, Caesar um, Santos not... and Dina Brodsky, they're the worst. Everyone is most jealous of them. Have you ever seen either of their, <laughs> their sketchbooks? Oh, my God. I know, I know. I mean, they're, they're wonderful. They're fantastic. And I, and when I do keep it, I always think, like, God, why don't I do this all the time? You know, even if the sketches aren't wonderful, it's such a great way to record a moment, right? It's like if you aren't precious about it, like if you don't let your ego get in the way of sketching, and no matter what, I enjoy them when I find them later on. I'm just like, oh, yeah, that was, you know, especially when I travel, I always try to have a sketchbook with me, you know. But it's it's like, oh, yeah, that was that one day of the month that I sketched, you know. <laughs> but I'm, at least I did it. I'm glad I did it. Um, yeah, you can just leave so it lying I, around I just, with just that page open. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea. Or I could make, like, I could take all the different sketchbooks I've done and put them together so it looks there you like go. I'm a sketchbook there you artist. Go. Fake yeah. it. I'm, I'm going to do it. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but I do write and I write sporadically as well, but I, I, I write sporadically, but a lot, if that makes sense. I have always done it. And I actually, I talk about this when I teach is that that was such a I write in my paintings all of the time I really do and that was such a natural thing um, to happen because I've always had this habit it's probably not a good one that I would just write on literally anything my own furniture you know like I used to write on my phone back in the day when we had like handheld phones in our room I used to write on absolutely everything whatever thoughts I had or lyrics to songs and um, I still do that in my paintings and I um I like it visually but I also think it just you know I think of sort of the things I add to my paintings as like you know I've never thought of a better word for it than like a time stamp um and and so that is something that I do I like to like oh I'm cementing myself in this period of time by by writing something in there 
Um, so, so to answer your question, your your more broad question is that I would say um, I would say I, I'm more like visually inspired. I, I certainly don't have a, like a particular emotion that I that I try to convey in one painting. Um, like the example you use sorrow. I certainly think I have a lot of that in my paintings, but you know, it comes out in some ways. Um, but I, I only, I, I paint because I think I'm, I'm just, I'm a very emotional person. And this really is a meditation for me. Um, it sounds a little bit cliche, but this is truly how I am able to just get around in the world is by, is by letting all this stuff out in my paintings. And, um, and so I, I'm sort of, you know, it sounds cheesy to say, I'm not inspired by my own emotions, but I, um, I paint because I feel like I might have an excess of them. And I'm also very, very visually inspired. Um, you know, I sometimes, you know, just recently I was in the back of an Uber and he had this like, you know, one of those like old, he had like a, like this old metal thing to show like his papers and stuff. And it was, you know, it was deteriorating in the most beautiful way, like the way that metal does, you know, like orange and green. And I was like, ooh, and I, you know, I took a photo of it and I'm like, oh, why can't I get this like exact color combination? Um, you know, it was like this beautifully decaying metal that had all these incredible colors in it. So, I mean, a color like that, sometimes a composition of something um, I'll find very inspiring. Like there was these beautiful blackbirds on a palm. I live in Florida now and they were on a palm tree and it was just like a ridiculously magnificent composition. And I was trying to figure out how I could do that, but you know, with hats, like with a woman in a hat instead of these blackbirds. So I'm very visually, I'm a very, very visual person. Um, and I remember things visually and I respond to, to things visual. But then once I'm trying to, that into my into my um canvas it becomes a very emotional and personal um experience for me yeah yeah so i hope yeah. that does that answer the question yes it does yeah very well okay. are you still shy or as shy well was, um i was i would say almost actually mute for a while <laughs> <laughs> when I was a child. So no, I, I, I overcame it for the most part, you know, and I, I never thought I would do this for instance, a few years ago, but, um, um, be on a podcast. Someone, no, I never thought I would be able to do that. So this is, you know, hugely courageous of me, courageous. I'm just kidding. But, um, I would have never done this a few years ago. Uh, but somebody talked me into teaching, which I can't believe I did still, and I loved it. And then after yeah. that, I was like, okay, it's not a big deal. And I was so surprised that I, that I, I loved it. Um, yeah. So I don't know. No, I, I, I guess I'm shy in some ways, but not really, not the way I used to be. Good God. Yeah. No, thank God. No. Well, I asked because I was a very shy kid and um, it's only about five, six years ago. I read something about social anxiety and I, the more I read, I was like, oh yeah, that's me. Yeah, I relate, relate to that. And then at the bottom of it, it was like, well, take this little test and see, you know, now it wasn't a little test. It was a lot of questions. And um, I think a hundred was the highest score. And then, you know, if you were 50, you weren't. And if you were 40, you were whatever. I scored 97 on this thing. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Oh, okay. I think that must mean I have so social anxiety. Maybe I always did. Maybe, you know, <laughs> um, I wasn't shy. I just had really, you know, intense social anxiety. That's why I ask you. Used to, that's... Yeah. But so, it, so how did you find yourself doing um, a podcast? Did, was this a bit of a challenge for you to do for yourself? No. No, not at all. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Like, you know, yeah, like yeah. any, and anything like that, you, um, like there are certain things to do with social anxiety. I'm textbook in other things. I'm not like I've been on TV. You know, I used to be a presenter on a kid's show on TV. Um, I can do this. Oh. No problem. I can get on stage. I can public speak. No problem. Well, it's not no problem. It's it's hard, but it's no harder than anybody else. And in some ways it's easier. But like the sort of things I find very difficult are walk, walking into a room with a smallish group of people 
and everybody looks at me. That mm. my nervous system interprets that as they're all going to kill me. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Well, how do you know I they're mean, not? How do I know they're not? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's true. Um, I mean, I'm putting words on it, but um, like my, I go into like I get extremely anxious. And like thinking, what am I, what's, you know, when I'm going into it and going, what am I actually anxious about? And it's like, yeah, I have this feeling that they are going to attack me, you know? And it's like, oh, they're not. It's going to so be did, did knowing you're in 97 help you? Or did it just yeah. make you, did it make the feeling more acute? No, no, it helped me a lot, actually, because it was like, oh, because, you know, I mean, I was, I grew up in the 60s, right? So it was like, you know, you're basically being shy meant there was something wrong with you, you know? So reading about it and kind of going, oh, okay, this is a thing. And it's not actually a mental thing. For some people it is, but for a lot of people it's not. It's a nervous system thing. It's like a miswiring of your nervous system so that you're, like I was saying, mm. going into a room, my nervous system interprets that as if I'm in, in danger, like serious danger, like life-threatening danger. I wonder and what in your ancestral line would make your nervous system do that. God, let's you know, see. Think- let's see what seven hundred years of oppression by Eng- the English uh, people would do to a person's ancestral line. Yeah, I'm sure there's some lots of things in there. <laughs> it's, it's sort of fight or flight, isn't it? Right. I mean, what, yeah. like, what is it in our biology that would what you know? Like for me, speaking in front of more than five people is like ah. Yeah. I mean, I fear yeah, yeah. worse than almost anything. You know. Yeah, well, as I say, it gets a bit cloudy because there's a whole section of social anxiety that is to do with what people think of you. I don't have any mm. of that, you know, that that's not what's... Wow, that that's so interesting. That, that, that doesn't bother me. Um, it's not a it's not a cons- it's not a thought thing. It's a body thing, you know. So for me, it's just mostly a nervous system misfiring kind of thing. It, it's... Um, adding two and two and getting five all the time or in certain circumstances, you know? Well, I'm glad it helped. Yeah, it did help. Yeah. Maybe I could take something similar for myself, figure out why I'm shy. Yeah. I I don't know. I found it helpful. I found it helpful to particularly that thing about, Oh, it's not, it's not a mental thing. It's a nervous system thing for me. I I totally, as soon as I read about the nervous system stuff, I was like, yep. Okay, I get that. Now that makes sense. Yeah, I think anything that helps you not feel weird is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I was a weird kid. I looked like a boy. I was super awkward, and I didn't speak English. And I was in Maine, so you know, I was like, "Whoa, whoa. what'd you expect, yeah. mom and dad?" Um, <laughs> yeah, I've been in Maine. I, I I know what you mean. Yeah, and I mean um, northern Maine, northern Maine. Yeah. <laughs> So Monteach, that's their name on Instagram, says, um, in what sequence, how do you begin a painting? In what sequence do you add the paper and other materials? Do you have a plan before starting a portrait or is the process more organic? Do you paint from life, photos or imagination? So I usually start with um, what I call like a messed up canvas. So, um, you know, I just talked about how I write all over over everything um and i i started doing that more intentionally in the past few years where i used to kind of do it more organically where i would just kind of always have messed up canvas it's very unusual that i would have like start on a on a plain white canvas but recently i kind of mess up my canvas intentionally and then i put the portrait um, on top of that so um, I will write all kinds of things and all kinds of symbols all over um, uh, my painting before I start um, the, the portrait. And I know that's a kind of backwards for people, but that actually helps me to um, abstract my portrait so that I'm not too linear. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, if there's a line um, that shows up uh, like across the face because it was in my background, it's much more natural for me to leave it there um, if I like it visually, of course, than it would be for me to work hard on on getting like the likeness of somebody or a portrait the way that I want it and then abstracting it. Um, And so what I do is I abstract my canvas first and I do that with lettering or color or 
you know, all kinds of things. The only thing I probably don't use to abstract my canvas is anything with a lot of texture, just because of course, like, I don't want to make too much of a, of a commitment. And if I put something with a lot of texture on the first layer, um, then I might have to commit to working within that structure. And that may not be something I need to do um, or that I want to do, excuse me. Um, so I hope that makes sense. So, you know, I guess like sequentially, I would say I mess up my canvas. I then um, start to model my portrait, like, you know, in sort of traditional way with, you know, burnt umber and I let things shine through it. And then I start to um, either carry those, you know, abstract elements from my first layer um, into my portrait, or of course I will edit them out. Um, and then I build and build and build from there. I start um, adding uh, mixed media. And of course that's, you know, fabrics or papers or found objects. Um, uh, you know, I would say like after I kind of have an idea of what I want my portrait to look like. So I try not to rush that part because it is in some ways the most fun, like the most gratifying <laughs> to do, like to take, you know, a piece of fabric that I like and, and uh, you know, to like, you know, stick it right on there. Um, um, but like I said, because I iterate so much, um, I try to hold off on adding uh, the mixed media until I'm quite sure of at least my composition and, and, and what I'm gonna do with the body and, and so forth. Um, so I think in, in that line of questions, there was, um, do I have an idea of what I, of what I want to do? Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Um, I do, do I do, I definitely do. I, I usually have a pretty decent idea of what I want to do. Although I am also familiar enough with my process, uh, to know that it's going to change. So <laughs> I have an idea, but then I change it. 500 times. I mean, in some ways, it's the process of a lunatic, and I don't really recommend it. Um, to uh, You have to be super patient to do what I do, um, or at least just really forgiving with yourself, which which I, you know, I've learned after many, many years to just embrace all of these, um, all of these phases, and I know I'm going to change it. And I've now come to to just accept it as part of my process. But that was a, you know, that that took me many years to get there. So I have an idea and I also change it. And that um, you know, I would say there's a there's always a, a strong resemblance to my original idea, but I I would say almost never is it uh exactly like my intended idea. <laughs> yeah, I change a lot. I change a lot. No, and and I change expression. I'll change the position of the head. I change the position of the shoulders. You know, I change the background every time. Every time. I know there are ways to do that with technology, like, um, but I like to do it the old-fashioned way. I like to, you know, put it on there, and if I don't like it, I scrape it off laboriously. And I also think that that adds to um, the process. I actually visually find that. Um, kind of interesting. So maybe subconsciously, I, you know, quote unquote, mess up on purpose, because I, I like the messiness, and then making it really neat at the end. I think it's just absolutely wonderfully gratifying to paint on top of a big mess. <laughs> um, was there other questions in there? Yeah, you don't ever paint from life. It sounds like it's always. Oh, I photos. do. I mean, yeah, like I said, I, I mean, I wish I could do that all the time. Um, I still do that as a practice, um, I, wherever I live and I've been nomadic for many, many years, but, um, I'm, I'm here for a while. I just bought my first house, but that's all to say, wherever I've lived, I always find, um, live painting studios because I just love painting from life. If I can, um, you know, this is 2023 finding somebody that's going to sit still for you for hours at a time is difficult. Um, and it's also you know, it's, 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 it's hard, I think, to, for me anyway, to paint from life and not just want to, um, you know, capture what I'm seeing. It's a different kind of meditation painting from life for me. It's like problem solving. I absolutely love painting from life, but I think it would be uh, difficult for me to do what I do, um, the process that I do painting from a life model. So I would, 
ideally like to mix all of all of those things. I would like to paint from a live model, um, sketch from a live model, and use photographs of that model. If I can get all of those things in one painting, I mean, that would be absolutely ideal. Yeah, for me. I don't like to use one reference, whether that yeah. be live or, or anything, one photo, one, yeah, one sitting. I like to use all kinds of different things, put all kinds of different energy into it. And how much imagination do you use in your paintings? Versus real life? Um, well, just um, in the mix, in the mix, you know, because I imagine, well, I'm I'm guessing there are parts that you just make up that it wouldn't be in your reference. Oh, that wouldn't be yeah, in your, there in your is. Yeah. yeah. You know, if, if something's getting too lifelike for me, um, then I will call forth my imagination, right? If something's <laughs> too like, uh, it yeah, sounds it like you have a conch static. for that, you know, that you blow into or something. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fantastic. I would <laughs> um yeah you know if, if something like if, if it feels too lifelike for me um you know the way that I paint if I'm if I'm if I'm sort of too much of a slave to my reference it starts to feel really static for me and so um I have a lot of different sort of tricks I guess that that I do for myself to get me away from um, my analytical kind of linear way of thinking, um, you know, and, you know, for me, just looking at it from a different perspective is always really helpful. Like I'll take a photo of it and look at it really, really small, or of course, looking at it from a mirror, turning my photo, uh, I mean, my painting upside down. And then I can like, I can sort of separate myself from it in that way. You know, when you're in front of a painting and you just stop being able to see it. So for me, I separate myself and I think like, okay, like what is going to make a better story? Like what's going to make it more interesting? And then, and then I take out my, my conch shell and I call forth my imagination <laughs> and I find it easier um, to do it that way. If, if I can separate myself from it and I'm like, what, what's boring about it? Well, you know, I don't ask myself what's boring about this because that's a tough question, but like, what would make this more interesting? Like, if I can separate myself from it, what is going to make this painting something that I would want to see if I was walking by it? Is it color that it's lacking or is it like something whimsical or, you know, so I, I use, I think I use, I try to use a lot of imagination. Like I, I, I think a, a perfect ratio for me would be about my imagination i was going to say 50 50 but I, i'd like to be about 40 percent reference and 60 percent imagination and i'm not there you know it's a work in progress yes, i would say um i'm 70 percent loyal to my 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 so-called subject or idea and and only 30 percent loyal to my whimsy and imagination and i would like that ratio to shift <laughs> yeah okay that's a lot of percentages <laughs> <laughs> That's what art's all about, right? Math and percentages and logic. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you do color studies before you start the main thing? It doesn't sound like you do, but I just thought I'd I ask. definitely don't. No, okay. I definitely don't. Again, though, I, that is that is a quality in artists that I admire, that I aspire to. But I am, um, I get very excited when I want to paint something, and I can't be bothered with um, any preliminary work like that. Yeah. In terms of the mixed media elements, though, do you gather a color palette or do you just kind of, you know, think, oh, this needs a bit of something and then you go looking for it? Yes, that this the latter. Um, so so I sort of um, in a way, I kind of divide my media, not in a, not in a super methodical way, but but a way that works for me. I do it by things that, that I use just for texture, um, like it, you know, I would say that I have like four categories. I, I have a category of things that I use for their sentimental value, um, whether it be, you know, things from my past or books that I've loved and, you know, that I rip, ripped up pages of or, you know, things that, that have meaning. So that would be one category. And then I have a category that's just for texture. Um, and then I have a category that's exciting patterns. Um, and then I have my color category. So that, that's sort of how I separate the things in my studio. Um, 
you know, I like to work like from old magazines and I rip the, the actual pages off instead of making copies. So like, you know, something like that would be, um, you know, like old life magazines. I like to use those because I, you know, sometimes you just do fascinating uh, verbiage in there or, or some some story or some word that, that that's really interesting. Um, so something like that, um, I would use for for its meaning and then you know i find earrings all the time so obviously something like that would be like something i would use for for texture or, um to break up the 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 paint um so yeah so that's what i do i i if i if i want if i know it needs color the painting i'm working on right now i'm still looking for just the right color thing and i know that it needs fabric and i know that it needs color and i have um you know, I try to keep my collection of mixed media trash to a minimum, but um, it, it is quite the process just to find um, the fabric that I want. And it's like a tornado goes off in my studio because of course I'm just like looking through everything, like the cookie monster, like looking through my fabric bag and then everything just goes everywhere. <laughs> and I, you know, I try it on there and I'll tape it on. It doesn't work. I take it off. I do something else. You know, I live with it for a little while. So yeah, that's how I do it. It's um, sometimes I'll 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 put a piece of fabric or media on my on my on my painting, you know, with glue dots or tape or whatever, some way to get it to adhere there uh, temporarily, um, and then I'll sort of paint around it and see if it's working, see it's if it's vibing with the rest of my painting, um, but yeah, that's how I do it. It's it's my process is yeah is really. Um, it change it, it doesn't my process doesn't change a lot but what i'm working on changes a lot uh, there is a ridiculous amount of iterations in every single one of my paintings for uh, and and with the media i use sometimes i put a fabric over another piece of fabric that i've already used um if i decide i don't like it so yeah that's how that's how i decide to do it it's not it's not that i'm looking for a specific color palette I paint and then I see what works with it based on what I have at the moment, which is usually quite a lot. Is there a drawing phase to what you're doing? And, you know, do you draw with paint or do you draw with pencil or because of the center of your, you know, of all this mixed media is, a, is are these beautiful portraits? I like to paint um, with paint. I'm sorry, I like to draw with paint, with burnt umber. That's the way I do it. I'm not great at drawing. Yeah. Um, it takes me, I'm not great at sketching for some reason. I've never found like just the right pencil that I always like working with. And so, but for some reason, um, I can draw or I draw to, much more to my own liking with a brush and burnt umber. Yeah. It's just, I, it, it's just much more natural for me to handle that. Um, so that's what I've, that's what, and I start, you know, I start toning and shading uh, right from the beginning as I'm drawing. And I, I, 95% of the time I start with burnt umber. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Sue Wong Kamak in New York says, what materials do you collage with and what are your favorite? Um, as an artist who uses collage, I have to ask, what do what do you use to glue down the materials? Mm, good question. Um, well, uh, I, I as far as my favorite media, I mean that's hard to say, but I I would say old magazines, and I don't mean copies of. I mean actual. And I'm very lucky now that people send me their old magazines that they find at yard sales and stuff. So, you know, I love old vintage um, newspapers and magazines. I mean, they're just so much fun to work with and really old news. Um, I almost bought a house recently that was, I think, built in 1890. And in the attic, there was stacks of newspapers completely intact. So, I mean, I was in absolute heaven. And they became so brittle that when you put them on the canvas, you actually can't, um, you know, you can't predict how they're going to react because they kind of fall apart. 
um, as, as you work with them. And to me, that is just the best possible scenario, an unpredictable media, because I, I love, I love anything that introduces, you know, spontaneity into my paintings. And, um, and newspaper is one of those things. I also really like old uh, vintage fabrics, like quilting squares with really delicate patterns. Um, and I like to use those uh, usually with a really bold pattern um, to, 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 ha to have that contrast. I find those things, you know, bring out the different qualities um, in each other. So yeah, old fabrics, old newspapers, and then really modern, bold fabrics um, with patterns. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then uh, new, oh, well, another thing I really love, I love to find, there are things that I find every day and on my walks, not every day, but there are the things that I find, my street treasures are always going to be my favorite thing. So when you start looking for street treasures, um, you find amazing things. I almost I would say once a week I find playing cards. You just always find them. Um, I find bits of jewelry. I like to use like notes, people's to-do lists, stuff like that. I love putting that stuff into my work. I love when I find things like that. I think it's just a, a, a gift from the art gods, you know? <laughs> you find incredible things. Like I feel like one of those, you know, lizards that has like one eye looking all the time for stuff. I once found three ripped up $20 bills, which I used in my paintings for, for uh, until I didn't have any bits left, you know? Um, I, you know, and who knows what inspired the person to rip up the three twenties, but you know, it was a great day for me. Yeah. That's brilliant. Um, and uh, what was her second question? What do you oh, use what to do glue I down? So I'm very loyal to, and this isn't any for any reason. I mean, certainly they're not paying me or anything, but I like golden brand. I'm just, I'm very familiar with them and um, I've always used them and they, they have so many great uh, mediums. I know they're made, you know, they're, they're not toxic. And um, I just think it's a, it's a really great product. Although I, I, you know, I also like Liquitex. I also like a lot of different brands, but I personally, just to keep it simple, I stick to one, I, I, I like golden. They have everything that I need. Like their heavy gel gloss works for, or semi-gloss I like to use, works for almost everything. I find so that's what I use to adhere and of course this is during the acrylic phase of my paintings that's what I use to adhere most of my mixed media yeah very good um Victoria Smith on Instagram says is there is there a material you would not use for your mixed media I, I think the only thing that I personally use that doesn't work is like like uh you know like t-shirt material like stretchy cotton it just gets gummy and gross and i don't like to use it um other than that i haven't found anything i, I won't use i suppose if something's too physically heavy i might have a problem with that but um i honestly there, there's not there's not much i wouldn't use except yeah i've always had a problem with stretchy fabrics that's the only thing i can i can think of that i would not use or, you know, yeah. I, well, excuse me, I could also say a lot of organic material you have to be, you know, weary of, right? Because that's going to, that's going to shift um, over time. As much as I would love to stick real leaves in my paintings, I understand their limitations. Um, yeah. And so, so I don't, I don't use things like that, although I wish I could. If I, if I'm tempted to use something like the leaf, what I'll do is I'll find a way to make an impression of it. Like I, I'll put it in hard molding paste or something so that you know, you get the feeling of it there, but I'm not actually using the, the, the physical leaf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I there must be something about t-shirt material because I've seen people try to use it in mixed media and it, I've never seen it work. It always looks, as you say, just wrong in some way. Gummy, yeah. Gummy, yeah. Hmm. Stacy uh, Horth on Instagram says... You, your use of color evokes so much warmth. Do you come up with a color palette before you begin a new painting or does it just evolve? And what does, uh, and what do you use to create so much texture and depth? Okay, well, we know that bit. So just the color bit. Yeah, um, well, I'm definitely inspired by palettes. 
um, it's certainly um, certain color palettes that I see, whether it be in nature or just somebody's outfit. Um, but like Ubers. I said, that it just a, <laughs> an intention. Um, and for me to stick to an actual color palette um, is difficult for me. Um, but it is uh, just because I don't stick to it doesn't mean that I don't think it's a good way to start a painting. Um, I think any reason to start a painting is a good is a good reason. Um, and so for me, um, if I'm inspired, like really excited about a color palette and it gets me to start a painting, um, even though it's highly unlikely I'm going to stick to that color palette, I'm, I'm still glad that that it was a jumping off point for me. Um, so I do pick them, although I am not ever loyal to it in the end, you know. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Do you yeah. have a different color palette? for each painting or do you have a like a sort of go-to color palette that you always start off with i i, I would say i have a go-to i think it just happens naturally with people right that you have the same colors that you gravitate towards over and over and when i try um at least all the paint you know a lot of the painters that i know right i sort of you get to know the colors that they use and the colors that they favor and even when i try to introduce um some wild color into my palette, you know, I sometimes I'm like, ah, like I'm scared of that color. And then I go back to the same old colors that I use. So I, I tend to use like a lot of cool colors in my backgrounds and then a lot of, a, a lot of warm colors um, in the actual portraits, which I try to break up with cools, um, you know, by way of my, you know, the more imaginative colors that I, that I use in the portrait, I would say are typically like cools so, yeah, I stick to a color palette, although I, I, I try, I don't want to say I try, I, 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 I would like to have more variation in my color palette. Like I would like to be bolder in my color choices, but I tend to just keep, keep doing the same sorts of colors. Oh, Did I answer the question? Or did I just go off on a tangent? No, no, you answered it. You answered it. <laughs> um so what kind of tools do you like well let's start off with brushes do you have a preference for brushes and then do you have particular tools that you use for the mixed media work um for brushes you know for some reason i like synthetics with my acrylics and then like the good old like hogs hair brushes for for my oils um, as far as shape and stuff, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not really particular to any, to any kind. Um, I, I, unfortunately, I'm not very kind to my brushes. Um, and so I, I, I don't buy the super expensive ones unless the big ones, my big brushes, I do spend money on those. I try to take care of those. Um, I don't like cheap materials just because I like to, you know, I like to think of my studio as a little sanctuary away from Mm, I don't know how to say it. You know, I like to I like to feel like my my tools are special and it's a part of of uh, my 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 process and my it's you know it's a little bit ritualistic and I and I like to know that my my the tools that I have are are are, uh, are quality. Um, I don't like to use throwaway tools. Um, and for my paints, definitely, I just don't like to use. I don't like to use cheap paints. I know. Um, I just don't like how they look or how they feel on my brush for me. So um, the the mixed media tools, is that what you asked me? I mean, yeah. really the only tools I have would be my brushes and my my mediums, which, you know, I, I do tend to use um, golden brand um, and then my paint. So I don't really have a lot of tools other than me. Yeah, my brushes and my mediums and my paints. Yeah. All of yeah. which I am, I would say I'm pretty, I'm pretty particular about them. Um, yeah. So when you're gluing a piece of fabric down, for example, do you use your fingers or do you use, you know, layer, layer of medium, put the fabric down, then another layer of medium on top of it? Is that how it goes? Yes. Yes, exactly. So yeah, I usually nine times out of 10, I do it with a, with a brush. Um, because for most things, I'm going to want to put the medium over it as well as uh, as to use it as an adhesive. I also use it to um, create 
like a consistent working surface, right? The reason I think that I'm I'm able to, um, or at least what I try to do is to to use my mixed media um, in a really integrated way, right? I don't like to use it like boom, here's like some giant piece of lace. I really like to incorporate it as seamlessly as I can into my painting. And the way that I do that is by is by creating one consistent surface. And I do that with my mediums. So for instance, if I'm using um, a piece of lace, I'm gonna make sure that I've, I've sort of um, sealed it so that it's taking the paint um, just the same as the canvas next to it uh, would be. Um, so it's not taking it in an Apache way. And I do that by sealing it. So I, if I seal everything, in the same way, then I can work on top of it in the same way. For instance, a lot of times, as a matter of fact, I would say all the time that I use a fabric, I'm gonna tone it um, with paint. I'm gonna paint right over it. Um, and if I've sealed it, I could use a piece of you know old newspaper, um, a piece of lace and a piece of fabric. If I have one consistent surface on that, then I can, I can um, work with it seamlessly because I'm not having to think about how one surface is taking paint versus another one. Yeah. And I, I think that's how I am able, um, you know, I guess it, it seems a little bit obvious to me, um, but when I teach it, you know, I think, I, I think, I think that's an important thing to understand about working with mixed media. You know, for me, I don't personally like to use something just to use it. I, I want to make sure that it's, you know, doing something for the painting. And I also want to feel like it's integrated. God, this is the problem with technology, right? I shut off my phone, but my computer's ringing, right? Because of the cloud. <laughs> so, excuse me. It's like everything's ringing. I tried to shut off my phone. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so so um, I try to yeah just to, to integrate to make sure that it's integrated in a way that it doesn't feel random, um, and I do that by by like I said by creating a consistent surface. So yeah. I, I I adhere it with the with the with the medium. I then apply whatever media I'm using, and then I put that same medium on top. Um, and depending, of course, on what I'm using, if it's a thick piece of fabric or lace. You know, I may need to do, you know, three or four layers of, of that medium so that I'm able to paint on it without it taking the paint in a patchy way. Yeah, it sort of reminds me of resin. You know, when people do that thing with resin, I know it's not as thick as resin, but it's kind of like sealing the layers, you know, into on top of each other. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so with all that going on, okay, because you've got paint, you've got mixed media, you've got layers, how do you mm -hmm. check yourself as you're working? You know, like in standard kind of painting, artists will use mirrors, they'll be jumping back and forward, they'll be taking pictures mm -hmm. on their phone, mm -hmm. you know, th that kind of thing. What, what sort of things do you do? I do all those things you just mentioned, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I spend, you know, I, I would say that I, I spend a lot, like when I think I'm done sometimes on, on a painting, I will then spend another month on it, you know, and, and <laughs> I, I, I have to, it has to feel a certain way for me to know that it's done. And I have to look at it in a million different ways in a million different lights. It's hard for me to do, but if I'm really struggling with a painting, which happens, I will not touch it for a few days because then this magic happens where I can suddenly see something, right? Of course, like I'm sure most artists have experienced that where you're working on something for so long, you're not able to see it. And, um, you know, when I teach, I tell people I'm like a broken record, just like take pictures because for some reason, um, you can have something right in your face and you don't see it. And then you look at it in a different, in a different way. And suddenly if something's very, very obvious to you. And of course, 
you know, mirrors do the same thing or, or looking at it in reverse. Um, but, you know, yeah, what I'm looking for personally is, is um, I guess, to know when it's finished. You know, I, I suppose it sounds sort of obvious, but I, I would say that one of the most important things is like that, that it's that the the face is saying what I want it to say, right? And um uh you know I, I suppose what I'm trying to convey in a painting is is some sort of you know ineffable emotion. I'm not uh, you know it's not this one thing I'm trying to paint, but I'm I'm trying to express something, of course. And um I just happen to use a a, a sort of um obvious way to do that i use the human face right we can all most of us can read emotion on a human face and and um and so that's what i what i'm i'm using that that vehicle to, to to try to be able to express myself and of course it's it's um you know we can all see it and i also use color so when i feel like those um when I feel like I'm saying whatever it is that I'm trying to say, and it has a good composition and it feels vibrant and bold, then I know that I'm done. And sometimes I need to take it outside and, and see if I like it in that light and take pictures of it upside down and move it around and use mirrors. And sometimes I put it on, you know, my big computer screen. Um, and I have to, it has to feel right to me in all of those, um, situations and it's it's very hard for me to get hard would be the wrong word but it's sometimes when I think I'm done I'm kind of afraid to look at it in another way because I'm like oh my god what if it's not really done like if I take a picture of it and I'm way off and of course that happens all the time you know I might get really excited about it and think like oh I'm just about to be finished with a painting which is always such a you know it's so exciting for me still to finish a painting every single time and um, and then there's always this part of me that's a little bit afraid, or maybe a lot afraid, to go look to really look at it because I'm like yeah, I'm not, yeah, I might yeah. not actually be finished with this <laughs> for another month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just listen to you talk. That's yeah. Like I, I've, I've kind of realized. Yeah, for for me, it's nothing bothers me. <laughs> that's how I know it's finished is like when nothing's bothering me I can look at it and look at it and look at it and I can't find anything that un disturbs me like, oh okay I think it's oh finished. yeah well that's you know what that's a really good question you know I like I've, I've been teaching lately and it's it's been such a great experience for me in so many ways um but you know one of the things we talk about is how you know when a painting is is finished right and I had these series of questions that um you can ask yourself right um, you know, I'm back, I used to smoke back in the day. I used to love to smoke. And, um, I would, I would smoke, like, I would like put my painting all the way on the other side of the room and I'd sit down and I'd smoke cigarettes and I would just ask myself these questions. And, and I would, I would literally write it down, you know, and I found that so helpful, but if nothing bothers you, that's really all you really need to ask yourself, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty succinct way to put it. Um, that's just one question you could ask yourself and skip all the other ones. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah. When, when nothing's bothering you and, you know, does it, does it say anything? You know, one, one question I really like is, and this is kind of hard to do because of course you have to separate yourself from it, but you have to ask yourself, honestly, if you were walking by this in a gallery or whatever, would you stop and look at it? Do you do you actually find this interesting yourself? <laughs> you know, it's kind of an obvious one, but sometimes it's like, I think sometimes it's like there's this need to just, and I, you know, I have to catch myself because of course I'm guilty of this as well. It's like, it's so satisfying to finish a painting and then make sure you're not just wanting to finish a painting. like. <laughs> Make sure, make sure you it's saying what you want it to say. And you don't have to know what that is. You know, like I'm staunchly against trying to intellectualize my paintings. Like it kind of drives me crazy. I just like, no, it feels right. That's enough for me. You know, I don't have to have any big message for me. You know, that's not how I paint. Yeah. 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 
Um, is lighting a big thing in your studio with the mixed uh, media? Do you have extra lighting things that you need to consider? No. I mean, you know, I like painting in big, great open spaces like this, um, my home studio that I have now, but it, it is actually kind of a pain to work. I, I, I like to have just controlled lighting. So it's sort of like for ambiance, of course, I want tons of sunlight streaming in, but for, for working purposes, it's, it's not uh, so good. Um, it's, it's just changing all the time, right? And of course, I have so many different sheens. Um, that it can, light can be a problem. And so, you know, for me, just trying to have a, a, a direct unchanging source of light is really all I need. Uh, I'm, I don't really need anything special so much as that it's, um, uh, you know, consistent. Um, yeah. And then you, of course, you know, take, you always have to take your paintings outside to see what they really look like, just, you know, for me anyway. <laughs> And to see what what all the different sheens are doing, and if if I have a lot of two different on machine, then I then I'll have to varnish it to give it, um, you know, to make it more consistent. Because sometimes the variation in sheens can be really quite distracting. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you listen to anything when you're working? And if so, oh, yeah. you do what what kind of things yeah. do you listen to? Um, mostly music. Um podcasts i have a strange addiction to ghost stories but you know unfortunately i feel like i've i've listened to every ghost story in the world so i'm kind of out now and i'm looking for like a new addiction um yeah so but mostly music i would say i, I really i i enjoy letting music influence me very much or actually whatever it is whether it be ghost stories or music or whatever I enjoy just like sort of opening up and let it all go in. You know, it's, it's fun to open and so to see what what happens. Like, if you know, sometimes I listen to like a contemporary tango and that's going to be like very different. And, um, you know, if I'm listening to like, oh, I don't know, you know, I listen to all kinds of music, but you know, whatever it is, like if it's like old country or, or some like sentimental French music or like, you know, piano, um, I I allow it, um, I allow it to, to get into me, right? I think that can be really fun to see what happens. Like how how is that going through your painting? Like, I think like some things that you listen to, like for me, you know, they might make you feel like obsessive and like tight, you know, like certain jazz and like some things you're like, ooh, like it's more like <laughs> fun Latin music, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it's fun to let it allow the music to influence you. I mean, but I once painted one of my favorite paintings while binge watching this horrendous show. I mean, it wasn't horrendous, it was really good, but I, I, now I can't believe I watched it because it was so violent. I, I, I abhor violence, but I, binge watched American Horror Story <laughs> and did this great painting but of course you can't really watch when you're painting so I'm just like listening to all this like really violent stuff and, and painting so I'm not really sure how I did that and that was before I became a mom so since becoming a mom I, I can't really listen to anything violent anymore I'm not really sure what happened any, but I can't think of it as like fun anymore in the way I used to so yeah 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 um how do you name your paintings um well i get I, um it's gonna sound cheesy but it's 100 percent true i i really do feel like i get to know these people um and then and and i just feel like i just sit with them until i think i know what their name is <laughs> that's really yeah. it yeah, that's really it. Because they're invented, you know, 90% of the time anyway. Um, yeah. Do you feel like they tell you? Yes. Or do you, yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, God, I'm really enjoying this podcast. I've listened to a few now and they're brilliant. And there's so many of them. And I've learned so much from listening to them. And you know what? If I met that John Dalton fellow in real life, 
I'd love to buy him a cup of tea and have a chat with him. I'd love to do that every month if I could. Well, now you can. The tea part at least, because this podcast runs on cups of tea bought for me by people like you who listen to the podcast and send me the price of a cup of tea once a month through the Patreon account. That's patreon.com forward slash John Dalton gently does it. All one word. And if you're one of those people who already send me cups of tea through Patreon, thanks a million. The tea is lovely and I really appreciate it. Now, the great thing is that if you can't afford to send me the price of a cup of tea or you don't want to, that's fine. You still get exactly the same podcast for free. It's sort of an honor system where the people who can afford it and want to pay for the people who can't or don't want to. So it's all lovely. So if you'd like to send me a cup of tea once a month, you can do that through Patreon. I'd really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference to me. Um, Su Wong Kamak again says, um, what do you seek to express in your portraits? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I had talked about this, this feeling that certain, um, photographs will, will give you, right? Like for me, it's a combination of all these different sort of complicated and I don't know, it's just, I mean, it's certainly not one emotion that I can put a finger on, but if, if there's a feeling that you would get from looking at, um, a portrait of a of a man who's about to go to war, and you know it's the most important photo he's ever gotten his head blown off in war. Or, you know you don't know he's leaving his sweetheart or whatever it is, right? There's like this certain ache. It's like beautiful and sad, or you know whatever it is. So trying to put words into it is is this silly, but there's a feeling that I for I get, and I think a lot of people get when you're looking at something like this. It's like really personal. And, um, and, and that feeling, whatever it is, then that's what I'm trying to convey. Whatever it is that I saw in that photograph that moved me, um, that feeling that doesn't necessarily have words and mixture of all these very complicated things that I feel when I look at a photo like that, then that's what I'm trying to express in, in, in the portrait that I'm doing in, the, in honor of that photograph that I've seen. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah, it does. Um, Mariana on Instagram says, what were the different styles you went through as an artist and how did those styles lead you up to how your art style is now? I'm really curious because I love what you do with your art now and want to know what led up to this unique style of yours. That's a really good question. Um, it took me a long, long time to get to a style that I actually like. Um, I, all the different styles I did, I think what, when I was really, you know, and of course I'm still trying to find my footing as an artist. So I, 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 I'm not trying to say that I, you know, I've arrived, um, but I'm much closer to where I want to be than when I started. And I think that, um, you know, and, and probably because I didn't go to art school, you know, I, I think it was very important to me when I was teaching, sort of learning to paint. Um, and I think this is with a lot of people that, that, that are learning to paint. Like I wanted to, to make something look like something else, right? So I, you know, I thought it was just the cat's meow if you could like, you know, make a, 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 a hand look like a hand or a tree look like a tree, right? And of course, that's how I started. That's how I started to paint. And um, just basically, you know, not copying, but trying to get a likeness. And um, and then when I was in my my, uh, you know, and I, I was quite good at it. I am I am I, I guess I could say that I, I'm I'm if I'm good at anything, it's I'm good at um, making you know capturing a likeness to to someone in a portrait. I think that that's something that I can do. Um, and when I was trying to make a living as an artist I, I I did these paintings of um much much more realistic paintings of of women um almost exclusively women uh, probably exclusively women back then and um you know I have four sisters and I use them a lot as my models and they were very realistic and a lot of like loungy women um 
I liked, I like lots, like lots of leggy kinds of women lounging around on couches. I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, and they were quite realistic. Um, and I really, actually, I really enjoyed doing it for a long time. And, and I was lucky to have all these models around me you know, all the time, um, my sisters. Um, but then I started doing art fairs. And I don't know if you had those in Ireland. Do you art fairs? Yes. Yes, they do. Yeah. Well, that sucked all the joy out of painting uh, from me, like a vacuum, <laughs> honest to God. And so, and then, um, so, you know, I, 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 for a while I was having fun and I, and I was mixing these sort of realistic kind of sexy women, sometimes with unlikely, um, uh, you know, companions, you know, for instance, I used to paint a friend of mine all the time. She, she was wonderful to paint. She was a great model and, and she had a, just sort of like the perfect build for a painting. And she was a great model and she used to pose for me all the time, but I would, I would paint her and all her wonderful long legs and everything, but I would paint her, you know, with a goose or I like to, to mix um, realistic women with animals and put them in sort of unlikely situations. It was, my stories were much, much more, my paintings were much, much more about stories back then. Um, and then, you know, I did that for a long time. I did art fairs. And then at, when I was done with art fairs, thank God, I went through years where I knew I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, and that time I was painting from the live model um, in New York. Um, and I got uh, very into portraiture. Um, but I knew I didn't want it to be completely realistic either. Um, but it took me I would say that, you know, I call it an art crisis, you know, maybe that's a little bit dramatic, but I went through about six years of going to my studio every day, which is, you know, really a kind of torture and not knowing what I wanted to do. But I showed up every day and just, you know, hoping for, for to figure out what my next thing was going to be. Um, and I always painted portraiture, but that, that seemed like, um, I knew I couldn't necessarily, or I didn't want to make a living doing that, you know, and, um, but I really enjoyed it. And so, you know, I don't want to go too off on a tangent here, but I, but I started studying um, at the league. I was doing, uh, I was doing my portraits and then um, because my mother, I forgot to mention this, but my mother did collages um, when I was growing up. And so collaging was always just very natural to me. I didn't really think about it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like this decision I made in my older years to, to, to start collaging. Um, so what happened is um, I just slowly started to incorporate collage into my portraits um, and different media and eventually it evolved into what I'm what I'm doing now I started to embrace it and enjoy it and become um, more bold with my choices as far as my media and and eventually involved into something that I that I really really enjoy and my subject might change as it is sort of you know um, subtly right now I'm going from more like characters and and um, you know imagined people to people in my in my actual life um, but the process, I think, is going to stay with me for a long time because, it, you know, it, it gets to incorporate so many of my of my interests. Um, and it's so tactile. And I, I really enjoy it. I feel like even if I'm walking with my daughter or my dog, I can, you know, there's still a little piece of me that's always kind of looking for something interesting to, to incorporate into my paintings. Um, and so I've gone through a lot of different style but I've always painted people people has has always been um my my main subject do you remember the first painting where you added something to it like or was it a case of you were doing collages but they were just that they were just collages yes oh yes I'm, I'm so sorry I I was doing <laughs> collages I excuse me I was I didn't mean to anticipate your question but um, I was doing strictly collages like for a time and then I went to, to realism and then I started to mix them. So yeah, I do remember because it felt good. And I was at a studio in New Hampshire and I remember that studio had started to 
oh my God, I just remember going in there every day. I'm like, <laughs> when am I going to do something that I like? You know, I was yeah, trying wow. every Six I years. Trying. Well done. It was, yeah. it was a six year art crisis. You know, it really was. I was doing <laughs> landscapes. I was doing all kinds of things, but you know, I, 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 at that point I was, I was, you know, I was still trying to make a living as an artist. And when mm. it's, it's difficult to do when, you know, there's no cohesion. Right. Um, so it would, it was sporadic and how I, how I sold and how I worked and it, it, it's hard to get a flow. I was, um, I was hosting live painting classes. And so I was lucky. I, I've always kept like, you know, uh, art in my life. I've always, most of the time I've found a way to make a living at it, but, but that time was hard. I even had another small, um, business where I had, I worked under a different name and I did um, like children's art, um, under a different name. And, you know, that was, I did that during that time, just like, okay, well, as long as I'm creating, eventually I'm going to get to this, uh, you know, this, this, I don't know, this stage where I'm, I'm truly in, enjoying my practice. And, you know, I think mm. I put in my time, you know, six years. Of, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> um, Susan. Yeah. Let uh, me just say one thing for people yes. that, you know, for, for, I want to speak to that. Loves me about this. Like, I just think that six years of an art crisis, you know, I think like people have like, people that are just learning or whatever, you can get very frustrated in the studio and have a few bad days, but you know, just get through it. I went through six bad years, you know, that's all I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, Susan Oviat Russell on Instagram says, how do I find my style without copying someone else's art? Oh yeah. That's such a good question. So actually I have an art group um, that we, you know, we try, we try to meet up a couple of times a week and um, we discuss our, our own practices and our work and stuff. And this, this is actually something that came up and one of my friends shared something, which I think is so interesting. Um, and I wish I'd, I wish I'd, I wish I'd printed it so I could see it, but you know, people ask me this all the time. And I think, I think what you can do is, you know, ask yourself what it is so that you don't copy, right? There's always something about another person's work that is going to speak to us, right? Or you find really exciting. And of course, you don't want to copy that. Um, so one way to do that is to ask yourself questions, like what is it that you that you like about this painting? What is it that moves you? You know, actually write it down. When you ask yourself those questions, like actually write it down. And then refer to your list when you're creating your own art rather than referring to that artwork. And that's one great way to keep from copying, you know, whatever it is that you like about it. Um, there's other ways to convey it. You know, if, if, if it's like an exciting color palette, um, you know, what is it about that color palette that excites you? You know, ask yourself those questions and then just use that rather than copying that particular color palette or you know are, are they really loose do they use huge brush strokes you know it's easier to come up with your own style if you if you ask yourself questions like what is it that you if, if you like something about a person's painting what that's saying is that you share that aesthetic and um rather than trying to take that person's aesthetic um, or that very particular thing that you like about that painting into your own painting, um, it's much more gratifying to find what truly resonates within you about it and then convey that. And that's how you're gonna get to your own style, right? And of course, you know, the most powerful thing you can do is be the most you you can be, right? So. <laughs> So ask yourself, what is it that moves you about that painting? Keep doing that over and over, like open yourself up to what it is that you love, what it is that you find exciting. And, you know, it's not like lip service. When I, when I ask myself these questions, which I often do, I'm actually asking myself and I actually answer them, you know, it's a real practice to, to get 
if, if you want to make really authentic work that's really yours, um, you have to you have to ask yourself questions about what it is that you like and why, and then answer those questions when when you're painting, rather than saying like, oh, this guy used like orange and red beautifully, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use orange and red that same way. Then you're only gonna do what this person wants to do, this other artist, and not what what you want to do. Yeah, that was it's really wordy, it's but yeah. No, it's um, brilliant, I think, but I'm not sure if I completely got it. So let, I'll tell you what I think you said, and you can tell me if I'm right. Um, because like what I think is brilliant about it is it's it's shifting the focus from the external stimulation, like, oh, I like the way the color palette or I like the brush stroke, and shifting the focus to the internal sensation that you have when you're looking at that and you're taking note and you're drawing that out of yourself. What, how is this making me feel? And that's what I want my art to make me feel like when I, I look at it. So you're kind of creating this inner checklist that you can use to check what you're doing. And it's not necessarily to do with the external thing, like the, the brush stroke, the color palette or whatever. It's like, if it makes me feel the way that other thing made me feel, then I've ticked that box and I'm on the right track. Is that roughly what you're saying? Yeah, yeah actually, yeah. Uh, you said it actually quite more eloquently than, than I did. That that is that is that is a, that is right. You know, another way, like um, I sometimes object to people writing things across their canvas that they want to convey. Right? It's the same thing. It's like some people, someone will write hope across their canvas, and I'm like okay, but is there another way? Like, what does that word make you feel? Like, why Why is it that you want to write this word? Like, ask yourself, is there another way that you could convey hope, like through a blue sky or, you know, some symbol? Um, and so that's kind of another way to put it, right? It's like, um, if there is something within that painting that resonates with you inside, it's when you try to convey that through your own painting, it's going to be much more authentic and much more genuine. Um, if you're doing that in your own way, convey whatever it is you find exciting in this painting in your way. Um, so yes, an inner checklist. It, it, yes, it's it's that's what you said is right. It's like for it, it's it's sort of like ignore the external value of it and find what it is about it that resonates with you. Um, in an emotional way or in a, in a different way. Yeah. Brilliant. Gold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patricia Espinoza says, I'm a big fan of your work, Juliet, and I always love how you speak and relate with the characters you paint. At what point in the process does that relationship start and how attached do you get with them? And is it easy to let them go? Aw, what a beautiful question. Um, so could you repeat, could you just repeat the first part again? I just want to make sure I answer. I, I, I'm just sticking to, for some reason, my mind wants to talk about the part. Is it easy to let them go? Um, so could you, would you what, mind what just point, repeating At what point in the process does the relationship start? And how attached do you get with them? Um, yeah, at what point does the relationship start? I get quite attached to um, the characters. Um, and I do make up stories about them. Um, and, you know, when it starts, I get more attached to some than others. There are there are some, believe it or not, that I don't actually like that much. I'm just like, oh, if this was a person, I just, you know, I don't think I would like this person all that much. <laughs> so with some of them, I have a sort of complicated relationship with them. But there, <laughs> I know that makes me sound like a nutter, but I don't care. Um, there's other like a, another way that I do it. You know, if for instance I'm finding out on my walks, if 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 I find like if things become sort of really, um, I don't know, fortuitous, like when I find things, then I, I sometimes add that to their story, you know, um, like for instance, if I'm finding a lot of cards and like in my mind, like there'll be like, you know, some gambling or maybe like the symbol of the heart will refer to this person in some way. And I develop these stories um, based on what I'm putting into um, the media. 
I mean, I'm sorry, what I'm, which media I'm putting into the painting. Um, so that can add to their stories. And depending on what that story is, will determine, you know, my relationship with them. You know, I painted a guy that I kind of had a crush on once, which was weird, right? Um, I was like, oh, this guy's like really kind of awesome. And um, was he a dead I person? Do I did have a crush on a dead guy once. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not a chance. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I do get attached to them. Uh, they're, you know, it's it's like they're little. I create little stories, and I and and I also, you know, I write things in my paintings. I've always done that, and and I sometimes will um, write little bits of of you know these stories about them in the paintings. But then I always paint over it. Right. It's it's but I know it's there. Um, you know, I'll leave bits of it coming out, but um, I do feel like I do feel like they are, of course, they're not real. I'm not you know, I, I understand they're not real people, but I, I do get attached to the story. I do get attached to the narrative and I, I do get attached to the feeling that I've had when I create them and the feeling that they emit and um and, and like I said, that's not always like sometimes if, if a painting has given me a really hard time, truly, I, I have, I end up thinking that they're just difficult characters. <laughs> like this one's a, a pain in the ass and I can't wait to get rid of it. And of course, I never admit that, but um, at the time, you know, but I'm like, oh God, take her. She's been so difficult. Um but, but so some are easier to get rid of than others. There are some like whose presence, I my studio like like feels warm to me or, or comforting in some way, or they're conveying something that like oh I really like what this what this is saying, and then I'll, I'll want to keep them around for a while. Um, but it's not super hard to get rid of any of them, really. There's one painting that I've never sold, and it was the self portrait I did many many years ago. Um, my face isn't in it, but not really, but it, it's a painting. It, it, it's the only painting I've, I've never sold. Other than that, I'm happy to let them go. I'm happy to like be on your way, like a bird leaving the nest, you know, and like go, go have some grand adventures. And, you know, every once in a while, I'll be lucky enough that somebody will frame them really beautifully and, and send me a photo. And, you know, I love when that happens. I, I love to know what, what happens to them once, once they've left. So yeah. it's not too, too difficult. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, Susan Cartledge on Patreon. Thanks for the tea, Susan, says, I've had lots of fun looking at your art. It's beautiful and there's so much to see in it. I know a lot of questions will be about process, but I'd like to know about the words you write on or near the next, such as remain, booyah, reason. <laughs> Does this direct your work in any way or is it how you feel after you've completed it oh well i um it's not how i feel well thank you for the question by the way but um because it's a it's a it's a cool one i mean um it doesn't direct my paintings um but it does um you know a lot of times i'm not, i'm not even quite sure um where I got the word, you know, sometimes it'll be a lyric or something I overhear. Um, but then I feel like if, if it, if it feels like it's a part of that, of that, um, uh, character story, then I'll keep it. You know, for instance, the word booyah, I know exactly the painting she's referring to. Um, and it's something my, my niece always said, um, when she was really young and, you know, I wrote Booyah, like, cause she had said it and I, I wrote it, I think right across her neck with an exclamation point. And I was, you know, I was very happy when that, when I finished that painting um, and I was very pregnant and it just felt exactly right for her. And so, although there was, a, you know, a hundred other words that I'd painted over, um, I loved leaving that there because it felt like exactly what she would be saying. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, this might sound really odd, but when I was much younger and I was painting, I mean, I don't mean it in a really mystical way, although maybe I do. I mean, I, I kind of thought of my paintings as magic spells. I really did. And it was, you know, long before we had it in our, our sort of like 
culture everybody's always talking about intention and 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 things like that which is great i don't mean to to, to disparage that but um you know i used to i used to think that like really infusing a painting with intention was a kind of magic and i did it in a, in a, in a really literal way which i i, I literally wrote <laughs> things in my paintings um, or, or put symbols in my painting that I wanted to, to have in my life. And in a way, I kind of thought of them as, as like, you know, magic spells, you know, not literally, I wasn't really practicing a kind of witchcraft, but it felt in a way like that to me, like that I could bring these things to life. And I feel like I'm sort of still doing that um, in a way. It, I, I, I put, I, I really, I, when I do that first layer that I talked about, I write all kinds of things in it. And I, I try to infuse that painting with intention and meaning. And then I feel like I've already got this foundation of a, a strong feeling and a sense. Um, and I work on top of that. Um, and a lot of those words and a lot of the lyrics and a lot of the things that I write, um, you know, I hope that they they carry through um, all the way to the end of my all the way to the end of the portrait. And even though, you know, only probably five percent of what I wrote comes out, um, there are some words that feel exactly right to that portrait, <laughs> and those are the ones that I that I don't paint over. Yeah. But even the ones yeah. that I do paint over, they're still important. I I, I feel like there there is a, there is a, a magic of the intention of having them there that the um the connection that it creates between myself and and that canvas that's what comes through it's not so much the words but like how did that word um how did how did that how did that word sort of come through in different ways in my paintings. I mean, I'll never know, but I know that it creates a connection with my painting and that connection with my painting is what makes a painting good. And, you know, I think what a connection between the artist and the art is what makes a painting magic. And me, for me, writing those things and putting those symbols creates a connection between me and that painting. Yeah, 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 that's brilliant. What do you do the writing with? Oh, I have a giant drawer full of all kinds of stuff. You know, um, I like charcoal. I, I love just old Bix, you know, like all ballpoint mm -hmm. pens, um, pencils. I I really like um, uh, Faber-Castell markers. They make really nice marks. Of course, I can only do that in the, um, in the acrylic phase, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, and then with the if i'm writing on top of oil which i also like to do there there's these um oh stabilo or stabilo i don't actually know how to say say it i've, I've never heard it said but um they're like write all pencils and they come in about six or seven different colors and they're yeah. they're pretty great they're like yeah. mark all or something they they write on absolutely anything do you know what, yeah. what i'm talking about I know, I know the name. And as you say, you've never yeah. heard it said. I've never heard it said either, but I can see it <laughs> as you say it. Yeah. <laughs> Stabilo, I don't know. Stabilo. <laughs> yeah. yeah th those are great. Those are great. And um, yeah, like I like those a lot. But um, yeah, carpenters, pencils, you know, all kinds of stuff. I like all yeah. different. I really just like, I kind of just grab stuff and see if it works. And if not, I grab something else, you know? Yeah. 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 That's. Um, I've heard quite a few art, other artists talk about that, and it seems to be one of the magic things about art creation is that whatever your intention is as you're creating, whether you're making pottery, music, painting, or whatever, is that if you're with the intention as you are making the thing, that intention gets uh, infused into the thing that you're you're making. Um, and that's always very vividly um, described. I remember Bo Bartlett. I don't know if you know Bo Bartlett, but yeah. he's, um, yeah, him saying that, you know, that paint has this magic ability to capture the emotion of the artist. And he gets his students to mix the paint and then bring the paintbrush up to the canvas. But before they apply it, they blow on it. 
And it's this like thing he has them do to just heighten their attention to what are they thinking about before they apply the paint, because whatever they're thinking about is going to be captured by the paint. And it's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. And and I think it's so true. I mean, isn't that what, you know, like the most, I mean, isn't that the magic of art, right? That you're yeah. able to feel something from it. And where does that feeling come from, right? Yeah. It's like, and he paints on a tiny island in Maine most of the time, by the way. So Bo Bartlett, did it, I think he owns his own island in Maine. He does. Yeah, he's yeah. been on the podcast a few times. Yeah, it's oh, kind of really? half and half. half I hear it. I would love to hear it. Yeah, he's been on maybe three times at this stage. Yeah. Wow, I didn't. I yeah, didn't he see splits that. his time. I think he he summers on the island and then he winters yeah. in Atlanta. Yeah, well, you and can't he's... winter in an island in Maine. <laughs> that doesn't work. Well, you can, but it'd be miserable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd never leave that. Yeah. You'd never go outside. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's that's beautiful. I think what like anything you can do to get your feeling, your your intention in there, like that's just going to make your painting better and better and better, you know, yeah. which speaks to what we were talking about earlier about not copying. You know, it's um, yeah. The, the, that goes it's like i've got two of those in my head one is bob bartlett talking about that and then the other is the actor the irish actor gabriel Byrne, and he's talking about acting and i think it's in the actor's studio or something very you know grand and he's saying uh he was talking about his journey as an actor and he said uh, that things really clicked for him when he figured out that the camera has this magic ability. He probably didn't use the word magic, but anyway, has this <laughs> magic ability to capture whatever you're thinking about as an actor. Oh, wow. So all I have to do, he was saying, as an actor, is just be very careful about what I'm thinking about when the camera is on and to make sure I'm thinking the thoughts that the character that I'm playing would be thinking. And then that's how I act. And it's uh, like those two go together for me because he's talking about exactly the same thing as Bo Bartlett's talking about. It's like the act of creation. If you're very clear uh, and you're you're conscious of it, then That's you know, as you create, through. it's going to come through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that I think that is the magic of art. And I'll say that word shamelessly, you know, um, I, I mean, I'll tell you a quick little story about that. I find that so interesting because I was going through this very you know, anxious time in 2016. In some ways it was wonderful, but you know, there was the election and my husband was switching careers and I was suddenly like, I was painting nonstop, um, which in some ways was wonderful, but I was also really anxious at that point in my life. Um, but I was also very prolific. <laughs> so it was good and bad. Um, my husband was going from being a lawyer to, um, to, pro, to, to, to being a software engineer. And there was a time where, you know, I became like the sole breadwinner as a, as a painter, you know, which is pretty anxiety inducing anyway, but, um, it was also the elections and it was all this. I was just like, Ooh, we were, we had just moved to California. In any event, I, I was painting a lot and this um, magazine approached me, which was, um, spirituality and health, which so interesting because I only had two um, subscriptions uh, subscriptions at that time. Um, and that was one of them. The other one was the New Yorker. Um, and they asked me to be their featured artist. And I said, yes. And then um, that was a, a crazy coincidence. But what I thought was so interesting is that the article that they used for the, the series of paintings that I was doing was about anxiety. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, see, it is, it comes through, right? Like, certainly that's not what I was aiming. Like, I, I wasn't aiming to, to paint about anxiety, but it came through. And I think, you know, I think that's so interesting. I think you have to be, like, in a certain state of mind. Like, for instance, for me, I'm having a very hard time, right? You know, right now, it's, it's sort of a difficult time for me to be in, in my studio for a, a, a lot of reasons. But I think that if I was in a different state of mind, for instance, I wouldn't be spending three days on an eye, you know, which I've just done um, because I'm in a certain state, right? And of course that comes through this sort of like, um, uh, you know, like this, this, this need to be like precise and that comes from a certain state of mind, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so of course, like something like that can come through. And of course we don't, we don't, we might not know with words like, or, you know, exactly like what we're seeing in that painting, like, why why do i 
feel a sense of uh, anxiety in this painting or, or whatever it is. And it could be something, you know, like that, like how you apply the paint, what colors you choose, right? At that time in your life, whatever it is you're listening to, whatever you're going through. Um, you know, my sister died a month ago and it's like oh, wow. been very hard. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Oh, but it's, wow. you know, I know that it's affecting how I paint greatly. You know, it's, yeah, it's, um, sure. I mean, even just painting at all has been like, you know, I haven't painted at all since November. I've done any kind of work. And um, of course, it's going to come through regardless of what I listen to. Right. She was regardless of how much time I spent in my studio. There's no way you can mask that level of emotion. Like, you know, I, I, I just spent three days on an eye because part of me is going crazy and that's coming through in that way. Right. Yeah, and um, the I fact that you would have painted her in the past as well, the association would have been there. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, 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 it's all like these very strong emotions are going to they're going to come through whether you you want to convey something. I mean, at least it's my opinion, right? For me, I'm an emotional person anyway, perhaps like excessively. But, um, you know, I, I, I paint that way. It's very important to what I paint is probably central to to what I paint and I don't think that it's possible for me to mask what I'm going through I think it just goes right through that paintbrush and comes out whether I want to or not yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah. I think it's like it's great that you are painting again because you're 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 painted out you know it'll help you in the process being able yeah to I've paint, actually paint I'm so painted. grateful that I I have it I really yeah. am. I'm like, God, how do other people deal with loss if they don't if they don't have an outlet? You know, people that don't have an emotional an outlet to get that stuff out. I'm so grateful that I that I have my practice uh, yeah. because I know that's how I'm going to cope. That's yeah. how I'm going to get through it. Yeah. Yeah. But I just uh, said that without crying, so I am very proud of myself. Oh. <laughs> yeah yeah you're doing great <laughs> thanks um susan also had another question she said what has been an element uh you've tried in your pieces that didn't work out so i'm guessing she's talking about the mixed media stuff something hmm. other than t-shirt material which you mentioned yeah well you know a lot of times it happens that there, there are some, something tried and true, um, you know, like lace. Sometimes I put it on there with my mediums, which man, that stuff sticks, right? When I use that medium and you put fabric, like you better make sure you want it there. And it happens um, all the time that it's happening with the painting I'm working on right now that I, I have quite thick lace and then I've decided I don't want it there and uh, good luck getting it off. You know, I actually just put, like a heavy duty sander on the painting, trying to sand off thick lace, which I don't recommend, you know? Um, mm. So it happens that aside from that t-shirt material, there isn't something that I would um, really recommend against using. I would just say that, you know, be sure you want it there, you know, or at least try to be sure you want it there, uh, especially if it's, uh, you know, in the beginning stages of the painting. Um, and I, I still make that mistake all the time. And then sometimes undoing things like I, I like to work with metal, but I would say it only works out about 75% of the time. Here I go with my percentages again, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't always work out. And then I have to, you know, take it off. Yeah. Um, what I forgot to ask you, what substrate do you use? Like boards? Or oh, mostly canvas, or... canvas, mostly canvas. Every once in a while I use wood. Okay. yeah yeah like birch or but mostly canvas though mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's not canvas on top of a panel i'm just thinking about when you're talking about metal and things like that i imagine you'd be yeah i know I, I just try to buy the best quality canvas i can find you right. know yeah just um, you know if you get if you get the student grade stuff it's garbage it's like so plasticky you know for for what i do it doesn't work it also just feels terrible to paint on in my opinion 
Yeah. So I like a toothy, thicker, you know, canvas. But I, yeah, I typically just get the pre-stretched stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Ricardo Martinez on Instagram says, are your dreams as whimsical as your paintings? Um, that's a cute question. Um, I would say they're whimsical, but probably a little bit darker, right? I mean, our dreams are a way of our subconscious trying to work stuff out. I, I, I um, try to, I tend to leave out the darker stuff out of my paintings if possible. Or if I am going to put it on, on there, I'll, um, I'll paint over it, you know, a little flower or some light blue or something. So, um, <laughs> yes, they are whimsical, but also quite a bit. Um, yeah, I have some wild active uh, dreams, yeah, that I, that, I, that I remember every day. Not always to my benefit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They sound like uh, they're whimsical, like, what is that movie? Pan's Labyrinth, you know, you could sort of describe yes. that as, as whimsical, but terrifying at the same time. Yes, they're not always, you know, uh, dreams aren't dreams that way. Like, they're, they kind of tend to be, I mean, does anybody just go to sleep and have wonderful dreams all night? I don't know. My daughter seems to. She's always cracking herself up in the middle of the night. But um, I feel like I feel like dreams are the sort of the purpose of it. Like, you, you work through things what you haven't done during the day yeah right can be. Yeah, yeah, can be. yeah 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 why do you have wonderful dreams all night um most of the time wow yeah. what's weird about dreams is like it can be you know 90 percent lovely and then it can just turn very suddenly <laughs> yes it's not like you know i would have a dream where it's just 100 percent foreboding the whole dream um you know be like most of the That's time it's lovely. and then suddenly it takes a very strange turn um, yeah but yeah. yeah mostly they're good i mean yeah they only like you were saying about not being able to watch violent stuff on tv i can't watch anything like that on tv at all because i it will it, it will invade my they go into your dreams for sure that's, yeah. uh, that's exactly why i stopped watching breaking bad i tried to watch it twice and then all my dreams started being breaking bad themed and then i was like okay i'm done did you ever watch breaking bad no i watched about two episodes of it it's and so it, like, wild well, it's I I just check in with myself when I'm watching stuff, you know. Like how oh. how do I feel? And if I feel anxious, I'm like, what am I watching this for? It's just you know, like I notice that there's a lot of things on on uh, out at the moment that are to do with imposter syndrome in one way or another, and it's very subtle. Um, like someone who had a former identity and they've moved to another town and the whole thing. And it's kind of like, oh, this is interesting. And then, but then when you get into it, it's like, well, I, like for me, I'd be going, why do I feel anxious? It's like, well, I don't want them to be discovered, you know? And it's like, oh, okay, you know, look, I can, I've got enough to deal with of my own stuff about, you know, imposter oh, syndrome or what, so whatever, you know? <laughs> so you try to stay in a state where that's, that's a very good practice. And so you don't like to be in a state where you're feeling like what's going to happen. You like to stay in a, a chill state. No, I, I don't mind. Like, you know, I can watch Indiana Jones and go, what's going to happen next? And I'll be hanging on the edge yeah. of my seat like everyone. That's different to, you know, watching something and like feeling une une uneasy. And then going, why yeah. am I feeling uneasy? It's not like I'm wondering what's going to happen next. I, yeah, I am. But on another level, it's like it's, you know, I'm being, you know, something is being stirred up. Yeah. That That's not really um, helpful to me. You know what? That's how I feel every single time I go on social media, which is why I don't go on social media really very, very much. I, because if you, if you actually ask yourself how you feel, most of the time you're just like, oh, I mean, that's, that's so I feel so <laughs> I'm like, or I just like, I just spent 10 minutes on social media and I'm like, God, that is enough for the month. Um, but I don't watch a lot of, I don't watch a lot of TV. So, um, but I, that's a very good practice. Ask yourself whether you're on social media or watching a movie, how do I feel? Do I want to live in the state? Do I want to be in the state? That's a really good question. You know, you can ask yourself that when you're painting. Check yeah. in. Yeah. You know, sometimes if you're if you're painting something and it's awful, you can check in and be like, okay, am I super tense? Then maybe something's mm. wrong, right? 
yeah like yeah. you know you know when you fix something in a painting like you've had a problem and you fix it and you suddenly feel your whole body relax i don't know mm -hmm. if that happens to you. it happens to me i'm just like oh my god thank god i fixed that and i didn't realize i was holding all this tension yeah well, when you're talking about spending three days on an eye, I noticed the thing that I do is if I was doing something that I, I, you know, thought I needed to get right. And, you know, there's a sort of a subtext on the background of like, don't screw this up. And maybe it's a detail. And I, you know, um, and like I'll be coming in to do it and then I'll kind of check in with myself and I realize my whole body is like compressed into this tight little, <laughs> you know, <laughs> every sinew is like straining and I go, oh, okay, well, that's, I'm not, I don't want to paint something like that. You know, so I'll just yes, step back I know and see, exactly. if, I mean, see if I can circle around and come at it a bit more relaxed. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. And that's the stuff, that's the kind of stuff that translates directly into your painting. Like that's yes. going to come through that tension will be felt in your painting. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, Monta Mon teach, Monk Teach again says, uh, do you have any other areas or subjects of creative expression that you'd like to explore? Hmm. You know, I, I, I am interested in, um, you know, what I've said, I wouldn't say I'm lazy about color, but I, I'm not super intentional about it. And I am interested in, in trying to express myself more um through color right because i use i use eyes and you know flowers and patterns and all this stuff that i've talked about and stories but i really love the idea of expressing through intentional color choice um and that is something that i want to do um i have not done it like i said i just keep trying things until they work but I love the idea and I really want to explore the idea of ex really expressing something um, not strictly through color, but primarily through color. Um, yeah. You know, I just saw that that um, that Van Gogh exhibit, um, the immersive Van Gogh uh, exhibit, mm -hmm. which was kind of cool, you know, and I, I love the video aspect, but really my, my favorite part of that was, was, um, uh, was reading the, the letters he wrote to, to Theo and how he talks about color and the joy of color. And it was so moving. Um, and I, 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 I'm, I'm very drawn to that idea. Like what, you know, you know, for instance, we were just talking about like, well, what does this color make you feel like, you know, or what does this painting make you feel and trying to express that in different ways. I would like to do that with color. So it, it, this certain pigment, this certain yellow, like, um, you know, denotes a certain feeling for me and, and how, and how can I, how can I express strictly through my color choices Yeah. rather than like, I'm, I'm making this portrait and, and I, and I, I want to get the colors you know the colors have to be there because i'm not yeah. painting in black and white but to be much more intentional about my color choices so that is something yeah. i really want to explore mm -hmm. yeah well who springs to mind um uh, kerry dunn and aaron westerberg they are both like um i'd encourage you to listen to my chat with those because they um came through uh, some very unusual kind of color not unusual but I hadn't you know it's not I haven't come across it that often of ways of relating to color that I think you would like okay I will definitely listen to that yeah yeah Ker Kerry Dunn is pretty recent and then Aaron Westerberg is probably last year sometime okay but if you if you search for them on the website you'll find them but yeah they they I know Kerry Dunn um he studied with Nelson Shanks and they I can't remember the name of the guy that they his particular color theory, but very unusual and very like Kerry's colors are, are very distinct. And then Aaron Westerberg um, has had this whole way of it's like it's like doing color studies, but not. It's a way of um, uh, painting in one color. Oh, I'm going to 
explain it really badly. Have a listen to my chat with him and he, he'll yeah, explain I will, I will. it exactly. Yeah, but did, when you were talking about it, both of those came to mind. Well, that's a great thing to listen to while painting, right? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, Sue Wong um, Kamak again says, as a working artist and mom, both of which require time and attention, how do you balance the two? And is there any advice you can share? Well, that has been a challenge. You know, I had I had a child very late in life, and so I um, I enjoyed a life of complete and total freedom and working nonstop in my studio for as long as I wanted. And of course, um, I you know I wanted a child for a very long time, and, and didn't have one until I was forty two. And um, that has been a huge shift um in, in how I paint and as a matter of fact I'm, I'm really just getting back to my practice um in the past year and then of course the um the death in my family has has halted it uh, yet again and so um as far as working with my daughter what I've what I've realized is is helpful for me but also challenging is to do each one 100%, you know, and, and that is a challenge. So when I'm with my daughter, I am only with my daughter. And, and it's really, I guess, just about being as fully present with each, with each one of those as I can be in my practice. Um, you know, and especially because I have a home studio, um, it, it, it can be really hard to focus. And when, uh, when you're a mom, it's especially, there's a, you're, you're being pulled in a, a million directions um, at all, at all times. And, um, you know, I, I used to take it for granted that I would have a lot of time in my studio. Um, and so I maybe, you know, would mess around more than I had to, or just like, now I'm, my time is focused. My time in the studio is like, okay, I get like six or seven hours. Like I'm going to spend every bit of that time in front of my, um, in front of my canvas painting, um, and focused solely on my subject and what I'm doing, um, where I did not used to do that. I took, I took my time for granted and I do the same, um, when I, when I'm with her. And of course, I also have to accept that, you know, my time in the studio is much more disjointed. I, I'm i trying to find ways. I always, instead of fighting um, with constraints, try to find ways that type them into my process. And so I'm like, well, could what's you Could you say now? that Maybe again? Like, could you say that again? Because you broke up. Oh, sure. I'm just saying that uh, I said, of course, um, my time now is um, disjointed in my studio and I try, um, I, I think just part of my, 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 my way of living is um, that I try to, instead of looking at things as a, you know, a particular constraint, I will try to find a way to like actually invite that in. Like, okay, well, I don't have the time I used to have. How can I use that? To, how am I gonna let that affect my, my work in a way that's, that's, that's more with the flow rather than trying to work against it. So I don't have, you know, I no longer have like, um, I don't I don't get to work 12 hours on a painting. So maybe instead of, um, you know, obsessing over something, then I have to like find a way to like, you know, uh, express what I'm trying to express in, in, in a way that's, that's um, you know, uh, quicker, less obsessive, right? And, and just get it done. So, and maybe that will, maybe that'll work to my benefit. <laughs> so I just, I try, I, I try to just ex not only just accept it, but just like, okay, like this is my new reality. And how am I going to, how, how is that going to manifest itself in, 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 in the way that I work? And let's see, you know, where I'm, I'm still yet to find out because um, being back in my studio is still relatively new for me. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out um, a balance, um, but I can still say it's you know it's well worth it. You know, just having a child alone has obviously found its way in, into my you know every fiber of what I do, right? Um, and that's going to be another element. Um, being a mom is going to 
you know, I don't listen to violent stuff anymore, right? For instance. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all these things, they find ways to like creep into your life and into my into my practice. And being a mom is a, a big one. And um and and one of that is uh that I don't have the time that I used to. And you know, I'll give you a huge example of how that's worked to my benefit. Now, instead of, you know, I've I've been in this um practice for many years now of I make a painting and I sell it. And I'm not doing that anymore, you know? I'm gonna I'm gonna um instead create a body of work. Um and I, I and I think that's partly because I don't have the time that I that I used to have. And so I'm gonna work on a lot of different things at once instead of trying to like, okay, I'm gonna spend, you know, four weeks on this painting and then sell it. So like that's you know, that's a big change that has come from from being a, a mom. Yeah. 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 yeah uh, you know, something tangible, something like, and I think that's a really good thing, right? Like stop me from being so sort of uh myopic about my 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 practice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Susan Carney in Maryland says, Hi there. This is a question about not copying. You have a painting, Miss Eva, where the hair goes straight up into the air. Mm. I saw this and wanted to use this idea for a musician I know. I tried it. Uh, the rest of the painting is different, but is that okay? I'm not sure. Can't wait to hear your interview. Oh, um, well, is that okay? I think it's okay if it feels, if it feels like it's authentic to you, like, if if you're if if you feel like it is expressing what it is that you want to express, and it's absolutely okay as long as you're not actually copying, you know what what was happening in Miss Ava. Like it's a concept, right? Like what is it that you you know ask yourself what we were talking about earlier? What is it that you like? Is it is it the visual that you like of the hair standing up? Um, or, or is it just the idea of hair standing up? Like, is it like the sort of like whimsy or, or, or you know, the, the, the fact that it's like a sort of an impossible thing to happen? Like, what is it that you like about it? If it's actually just the hair standing up, which is just kind of, you know, why not? I, I don't have any problem. I don't think there's anything wrong with using it. I didn't invent hair going straight up. So as long as you do it in your own way, um, then I think it's absolutely fine. I think I think using concept and borrowing concepts from artists, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's it, it's copying. It's not that there's anything wrong with copying either. It's it's you know it's a great way to learn. But if you're doing it as a as a way to to try to find yourself, you're just gonna it's a dead end, right? So that's that's what i advise that's why i advise against copying you're re you're really doing yourself a disservice um uh but you know as a concept of hair standing up if you do it in your own way i think it's absolutely fine you know yeah what do you think what do you think john i'm stuck on who did invent hair going straight up <laughs> 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 I sort of went to Bride of Frankenstein. Then I went back to Marie Antoinette. I'm sure it predates that. Oh, I think it was <laughs> she invented it. Are the Simpsons? The Simpson sisters, maybe? Well, they are after the Marie sisters. Antoinette, so it would have to be. Yeah, uh, a little. A little. <laughs> <laughs> I think she used to um, watch The Simpsons. Please. Yeah, I think, I think what you said is dead right. You know, like if you're, I think anything that you do in art that you think if you can be honest enough to, with yourself to to realize that what you're trying to do is is reach for a magic bullet that's going to make you a great artist it's not going to work out there's no magic bullet but i think if if you do what you're saying which is like if you if you realize that all external stimulus end up internally and if you can examine what's going on inside you when you see something and then you want to recreate something that has the same effect inside you then you can't you can't go wrong it might end up looking yeah. very similar or it might end up not it doesn't doesn't matter because you're you use yeah. a different checklist you know yeah exactly i think that's exactly right yeah 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 you ask be honest with yourself yeah and yeah i i think it's 
uh, be honest with yourself why you're doing it. That's, you know. Yes, very good. I'm glad we've sorted that out. <laughs> yeah, do. And we got to find out who invented hair standing up. Hair standing up. Maybe it was me, you know. <laughs> Uh, now I want to say Benjamin Franklin. Didn't he kind of do the kite thing with the roof? Uh, yeah. sort, sort of electricity. Yeah. I'm sure his hair was standing yeah. on end when he did that. <laughs> um, if that was a true story. Um, okay, this is my desert island question, right? So you're on a desert island. No one else is around. No one's coming ever. F your food and your shelter are taken care of. So you don't have to spend any time or energy on that. And you've got any kind of art materials that you would like are around. Do you still make art? that no one is ever going to see except you yeah absolutely i mean what else would you do <laughs> okay no too many people have said that to me what what else would you do let's say there's loads of other interesting things that you could do yeah i absolutely would paint you know i okay. absolutely would paint yeah I, right, so I painted long before the internet or anyone wanted any, you know, to look at my paintings. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think I would continue it. Uh, I love you, the practice. Of it. Yeah. Do you do you think that the paintings that you would make there would be different to what you're making now? You know, that's that's an awesome question. I I ask myself that all the time. Like, what are my driving forces? And it it's hard now with the age of you know, Instagram, right? Where it's like, well, you have this perceived audience, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of people, there's all these different elements that, that are with us, like this, you know, audience or, or, or teachers or, all, you know, all these different voices per se, not like in a schizophrenic way, but just like these different ideas and concepts that we have in our head that paint with us. Right. And I, and I think those are all great to have, um, not all of them, but I think most of those aspects are, are, are okay, right? Like our perceived audience, our, our old teachers, you know, I have, I have teachers from the Art Students League that like sometimes will pipe in in my head and be like, oh, that color is terrible or whatever, you know, like I know what they would say. <laughs> um, but uh, I, yeah, I think that, that to have the, there are some that are not so helpful. And, and for me, I think like social media and, and like sellability, they're okay to have, but I don't want them like, you know, driving the bus, so to speak. And so it's an interesting question to myself, like what would I be painting without this perceived audience that lives in my head? I think I would still be painting portraits, although, you know, technically speaking on a desert island, I would have to invent them. So, um, I would, I don't know, I would probably, I would probably still paint people because I really love it. Yeah. <laughs> but then I, I might, I might do it differently. I might do it differently. I don't know. That's, you know, it's a question I ask myself all the time. Like how much of my, how much of what I do is driven by this uh, perceived and imaginary audience, right? And if that was completely eradicated from my process, how would that affect my paintings? Who's to say? I'd like yeah. to think it stayed the same or maybe even got better, but. Yeah, I think particularly, it's a particularly important question if you have any kind of success, whether that's financial success, whether that's social success. You mm -hmm. know, I think it's really important to keep coming back to the yeah. origin of why you're doing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Paula Martino in Pittsburgh says, love your work and looking forward to the interview. Will you have any online workshops, sh workshops in 2023? Yes, I will. I, um, yes, like I said, I, I, um, you know, I don't want to get into it, but I, I recently had a personal tragedy in my life and I, I stopped doing everything. Um, but I, I am uh, ready to, start thinking about when I'm going to teach and um, and I will be teaching at least two online workshops in 2023. I think one of them will be in um, middle to late March and then another in early summer. Okay. And, and can people find out about them on your website? I will be posting on my website and on my Instagram. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. 
And they can Jennifer. subscribe. They subscribe to my website. Um, I mean, I only send out like one email a year, so no one has to worry about me spamming them. But um, <laughs> um, I do send out invites to classes if you uh, if you subscribe. And I only, you know, I only take so many students. So okay, yeah. Uh, Jennifer Singer Bell on Instagram says, um, what's the best way to get the habit of art to become a need big enough to motivate you to do it daily? Um, I think once you become super invested in one painting, you know, I, I, of course, I can only speak from my personal experience. When you have a painting that you're really invested in, um, it's hard to keep me away from my studio, right? Um, when you get to a certain stage in your painting, um, try to make your painting important to you in whatever way um, that is. You know, for me, I become very involved with that character and trying to convey a certain something. And I become a little bit obsessed with um, getting that right. And so for me, it's, you know, it's easy to want to go in my studio every day. Um, when you're when you're going through a time when you're not working, um, on something on a particular piece that's important to you, then my, you know, my driving force was trying to get there because there's, it's the best feeling in the world when you're super involved in a painting. It's why we paint. It's why I paint. Um, and that, that, that driving force is like, you know, it's the tits. That's, that's why I go in every day. <laughs> so, you know, you know, whatever it is that, you know, a lot of people like to paint people in their family or, you know, if, if people aren't your thing, you know, ask, like, find a way to get a, a build a connection um, between you and whatever it is that you're painting. And that connection, if it's strong enough and genuine enough, I believe will be enough of a driving force to get you in there every day. And of course, it's also, you know, it's also my job. Like we were just saying, I, 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 I certainly try not to paint with, with that um, in the forefront of my mind. But it is, I think, an important uh, driving force for me, you know. It is also how I how I make a living. Yeah. 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 Very good. Um, Parsons People Art in North Carolina says, uh, what have you done with your older work, the pieces that still linger? Well... I don't really have like I, I have that one painting um, that I told you about that that I've kept and that's that's really it. If the, if there's older paintings um, that I have that I don't like, I mean, one of the best things you can do. And actually, I want to go back to the last person that asked that question. Here's a great way to spend your time in the studio. If you have a bunch of paintings you don't like, for me, one of the most wonderful things you can do in the world is to paint right over them, you know, and to to let some aspect of that painting shine through right to the to the very, oh, it's the best. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm I guess I'm lucky in that I I I don't have a lot of work or really none. I don't have any really old work lying around. I've always um, very actively tried to sell my um, my paintings, um, and so I don't have finished work um, laying around in my studio. Um, although my intent this year is to have finished work laying around in my studio. I'm not, I'm not gonna sell any of my paintings this year. Um, so yeah, if, if, they, if they were hanging around, I like to, um, I like to paint right over it if I don't like it. Um, mm. Yeah, that's really yeah. good. Um, speaking of selling paintings, how have you got on with the business side of the art world like galleries selling commissions all that kind of side of things how have you found it you know i think i'm i think i'm lucky you know in that way you know there you know i sort of happily exist in my little art world you know i'm not in the high art world um but i'm lucky that i'm able to make a living i sell um my paintings pretty quickly after I um, paint them. I have, you know, my my set of collectors that um, really enjoy my paintings. I have a couple of galleries that I work with, um, and I've been really lucky. I think that um, what uh, my main problem right now is not being able to produce. Um, I'm not. I don't. I haven't figured out exactly how to 
um, create as much as I as much as I'd like. Um, and and I I'm such a slow. Well, I'm not a slow painter, but my process is slow. My process is slow, and so, um, yeah. But in any event, to get back to your question, I I don't really struggle with it. I I, I you know. Um, this year I'm not selling prints or anything that was taking up a lot of my time. So things that were taking up my time and keeping me from creating new work, I've stopped. Um, and one of those things is selling prints because I do all that um, by myself. And that is a lot of administrative stuff to take care of. I've tried to sort of eliminate that from my life so I can focus on creating new work because that's, um, um, you know, that's my number one issue that I have. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but you know, I would there. I would like to have um, an exhibit this year, and I know in order to do that, I have to have more than one painting. Um, yeah. And will you put that on yourself, or will you do that through a gallery? Do you think? I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure. We'll see. Yeah. 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 And what sort of what sort of price range are your paintings selling for? I, I would say like between uh, right now, like between like 2000 and 4000 or 4500, you know, nothing too crazy. Yeah, I, I, I don't go too too much further than that. Like the bigger ones, I go up to like six or 7000, but I don't paint large um, all that much. Yeah, um, I, I think my prices are going to go up because um, of the time I spend on them, honestly. And yeah. um Yes, yes, because I think it's worth it. You know, I've been putting a tremendous amount of uh, my energy and time into it. So I agree. I hope that doesn't sound cocky. I didn't mean it in that way. Like, no, it didn't. No, I agree. Like, I think you should put your prices up. That's the very yeah, good value. Yeah. So if you're a collector and you're listening, get in now. Wow. Oh, except you won't be able to because there's a there's a, a show coming up. Um, <laughs> What um, do you have a big art dream you'd like to achieve before you die? You know, my my dream was always to really enjoy my process and also to want to hang my own paintings up in my house. OK, so I think I'm halfway there. I <laughs> I love my, <laughs> which house? I love my. <laughs> I'm halfway there on both of them. Okay. I mostly love my process. There's a part of it that is still, um, yeah. So, which is not to say that I've mastered either one of those. Okay. And I, I think I'm working towards like my ideal aesthetic and my dream is, is truly to feel, um, you know, it may sound hokey, but I want to feel more joy when I paint, I want to feel less of that tension, right? I want to be much more like open and expressive. I find myself sometimes, um, you know, like, just like, like coming in on myself and, you know, like, like you said, like getting really, really fussy and like feeling the tension in my neck. And I want that God in my process. I really do. I want to go in there and, 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 and feel completely open. Um, and joyful uh and i and you know i don't I'm, that's not to say i need my paintings to emanate pure joy um but but i would like to have less stress in my process you know yeah. and 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 to be as open as possible i think there's still a part of me that's like you know, whether it's conscious or not, like people pleasing, there's a little bit left of me of like back in the day when I was trying to make something really good, you know, like make yeah. it look exactly like the model, you know, you're like, oh my God, it looks like a photograph. Like that would be a good thing. You know, for me, that's certainly not my goal anymore. It's, it's, you know, like I said, when we were talking about percentages earlier, I would say I want 70% like abstraction and imagination, 30% loyal to my model. And I'm yeah. still working towards that. I'm much closer to it than I was, you know, like some of my older stuff makes me cringe. Um, and I, and I, 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 I like what I'm doing now. Um, but I want to, I want to get better and better about being expressive and being open and, 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 
you know, asking myself, like, who's driving this creative bus, make sure it's not Instagram post, make sure it's not some imaginary gallery or, or juror, you know, and make sure that it's that they're heart focused and heart driven. Yeah. And to know that really not to have to ask myself, like, what is my driving first, but to know that it's a heart centered and genuine um, piece of art, you know, that there's not some like some bit of, you know, old insecurity driving the bus or something. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, okay. This is my last question. I ask this to everyone who comes on the podcast. Um, if there's one thing you could pass on to future generations, what would it be? As far as painting? No, it doesn't have to be. Can be, but can be anything. It can be general, you know. I would say, well, I'm going to talk about painting, but it's also, I think it, it, it translates to just how you live your life, to, to spend your life trying to be as genuine as possible to yourself, like to, to find out who you are. Um, and not, not, don't be lazy about it. <laughs> it's, it's actually work. It's actually work to, to, to find yourself and to, and to be honest. Yeah, very good. Brilliant. Um, that's great. Um, I think your paintings are fa fantastic. Um, I I didn't know they were mixed media. Um, oh, how funny. Uh, I had a feeling, but the thing I really liked about them was it doesn't it doesn't matter to me whether they are or not because they what's interesting about them and particularly i suppose because if i saw them in person it'd be, i'd be having a different you know reaction to them but whether they were painted or they actually are the physical thing um it's kind of immaterial to me because it's it's um the depth that's in them it's all these layers um and just from talking to you now, I can understand that there's way more layers to your paintings than just the mixed media elements, because you're sort of layering all this meaning on top of each other to create this really textured um, and rich kind of visual uh, experience, which um, is what I really like about them is that they are they've got so much going on with them um so that you know when you look in closely at something go is that a piece of fabric it's like well whether it's a painted piece of fabric or not it doesn't really matter and this thing you're doing you know like what you were saying about some bits are actual fabric and other parts are um painted fabric i think that's brilliant as well and the the process you were talking about it sort of reminded me the process of layering the actual um mixed media elements it's like the thing of you know mosquitoes being trapped in amber you know it's got that kind of vibe to it of like you're, you're <laughs> yes. ca ca capturing them uh in, in these layers <laughs> I love that. so you've got the layers of painting you've got the layers of writing the layers of meaning the physical layers and then that all just adds up to this just really interesting um, visual experience. But then there's also this, is some very tender things expressed. Some very like tender, I don't mean like tender emotions. I mean emotions that are very... Um, wispy you know they're very subtle um and you know some of them are tender but some of them are sad some of them are but they're very nuanced um the the, the different things that you are um conveying so you, to get all that going i mean even just getting being good at mixed media that's not easy anyone who's tried it you know you'll immediately realize it's not easy to be able to uh, bring in uh, elements and make it all work as a cohesive whole. Um, but to do all that and convey these very poignant human uh, 
sort of glimpses of the of what it is to be a human. Um, even the fact that you, you you've used a lot of very old uh, photographs as inspiration speaks to the sort of eternal qualities that you're capturing in your paintings. So yeah, I think they're great. I'm a fan. Oh, thank and you it's so been, much. Yeah, it's been lovely getting to know you a little bit and hearing your story and what what goes on behind you know from inside you as well it's been great yeah well i i so appreciate you having me on here i really do thank you so much for reaching out to me this was it was very fun it was i'm glad i you know what you're my you're my introduction back back into uh, my practice so that's why i said i'm gonna do something like big and scary and that's gonna get me right back into my studio so uh, for many reasons i i thank you for having me on and and, and letting me talk and um, listening to me and babble on. I very much appreciate it. No, it's been delightful. I think it's really amusing that, you know, I'm going to do something big and scary. And the first thing you thought about was me. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Finally. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you, when you first reached out to me, I had just bought my first house, which was like a crumbling old Victorian. I mean, it was that, you know, that week. Um, so it was just a crazy, crazy time, but, um, yeah, I am. I am. You know, your the name of your podcast, right? Gently does it. I was like, okay, I'm gonna gently go back into my studio, and I'm gonna do a gently does it with John Dalton. So here we go. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah. Okay, so we keep in, I keep in touch with everybody, and so for Zoom, tea, or whatever. So I'm sure we'll keep in touch. But yeah, we'll say goodbye for now. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, John. Bye bye. Bye. I've never felt this good in my entire life. Make me some spaghetti. Actually, I'd prefer a cup of tea. <laughs> a cup of tea would be lovely. So, yeah, just a little reminder, mainly because every second or third person who becomes a patron has got in touch with me and said, you know what, I've been listening to your podcast for ages. And I didn't become a patron, not because I don't have the money, not because I don't think it's great. I just didn't get around to it. So this is a little friendly reminder that if you'd like to be a patron, you'd like to buy me a cup of tea, go to patreon.com forward slash John Dalton. Gently does it all one word or follow the link in the show notes to become a patron. I would really appreciate it if you could do that, particularly if you've been meaning to and you just haven't got around to it. It would be great. It would mean a lot to me. All right. Thank you. Bye. We are the Argyle Pimps. So buy us a drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle Pimps. So buy us a drink. Come on, buy us a drink. Come on, buy us a drink. We are the Argyle Pimps. So buy us a drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle Pimps.